So good afternoon, folks. Uh, just so you know what's going on, we have a little bit of a technical difficulty. So we'll probably be starting the council meeting around 4.15. So you'll be here for a couple minutes uh, with us, just smiling at you without any work actually happening.
Welcome to My Teleconferencing. Please enter a participant code, then press pound. You are the only person on this conference. Please stay on the line.
All right, folks, welcome to the November 12th City Council meeting. Sorry for the delay. We have uh, one council member who is absent and one who is trying to call in uh, for the, tonight's meeting as well. Right now that is not going so well, uh, but we'll see if we're able to get her on board over the next couple of minutes here. Madam City Clerk, do you want to call the roll? Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of Mayor Schwedheim and Council Member Combs. All yes, time. just got here, but it's not through the um, it's not through this phone system that doesn't charge me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Council Member, we're, we're just getting started here. We'll try to keep you on the line the whole way through. Uh, for for uh, the public, just so you know, we will be moving item 14.4 from tonight's agenda to next week's agenda. That is the building code updates as prescribed by state law. Uh, as a simple explanation, we have to have four council members as a quorum who are present in the jurisdiction to be able to hear the item. Two of the current council members who are sitting at the dais have to recuse themselves from that item. So we will be hearing item 14.3, which is the reach codes, which is a part of it, but we will not be hearing the overall base codes uh, at this time. We'll hear that next Tuesday. No closed session items, no study sessions, uh, no proclamations. Mr. McGlynn. Um, so staff briefing? Yes. Uh, Fire recovery and rebuild update. Um, Dave Gwine introducing our sole item this evening. Hello? Yes, hi, Council Members. If you recall from last week, we had invited um, a representative from State Housing and Community Development. This is Sue Naramore. She's a Senior Specialist in Disaster Recovery. She's going to go through a very brief presentation on the Community Development Block Grant-Disaster Recovery for Owner Occupants. And then there also has a Frequently Asked Questions that was circulated to you today. So with that, thank you, Sue. There we go. Thank you, good evening everyone. So I won't go through all of the points you'll see on the slides. Uh, I'll leave the slides for um, publishing on the website later, but the, um, we'll go through some of the, the important update points. So the general update for the CDBG disaster recovery programs running through HCD to the 2017 disaster jurisdi jurisdictions that had 2017 disasters. Um, the important pieces for update right now are that we uh, received our, our fully executed grant agreement uh, from HUD in August. We have uh, stood up a disaster recovery section in Sacramento who will be administering the programs and the grants. Um, we've got full seven, seven full-time employees on and we actually will be adding more people with the 2018 money that are coming. The, um, we have executed a uh, standard agreement with our uh, consultants, um, GCR, uh, in partnership with a couple other different consultants as well, in order to assist us with program stand-up, program administration, staff augmentation, in order to make sure that the programs run as seamlessly, effortlessly, and um, compliantly as possible. Additionally, um, we've got a new grant system, a grant management system, eCivis. I would encourage anybody in housing to take some of the trainings that are happening that week on that new grant management system. It will put everything online so that we can reduce the amount of paper going back and forth. Um, it should make application processes much easier. Um, we've stood up the owner occupied, are standing up the owner occupied program software. Part of the a requirement for HUD with this program is that when an applicant um, submits a survey and or an application, they've got to be able to see where they are in the process at any time. So this is a portal-based system called eGrants that is um, online and, and easily accessible for most folks. For people who cannot access it, we actually can take their information over the phone and log them into the system and help them fill out surveys and applications um, by hand if necessary. Lastly, 
for the survey. We did launch it um, a week ago Friday and um, have 56 um, tier, we'll go into tiers in a minute, but it's 56 tier five uh, applicants and we've got, I believe, five tier one applicants. We'll talk about tiers in a second, like I said. Oops. Um, the Owner Occupied Program, which we're here to discuss tonight, is a gap financing program of up to $150,000 to assist in um, final reconstruction of uh, or repair, if needed, of uh, da disaster uh, impacted homes. To qualify for the, the program, um, the property must be owner occupied at the time of the disaster, um, and it must have been the primary residence of that, uh, of that owner. Um, the applicants must be current on property taxes, um, and, it, and obviously the property must have sustained damages as a result of the disaster, the name disaster. Um, we'll switch to, we'll go to, um, in the FAQs we'll talk about prioritization, that's what the tiering is for. Um, we'll explain that in a minute. However, within that prioritization, any family that, um, that identifies as having a member that is disabled will rise to the top of whatever tier they qualify for. The mandate of this funding is to assist first and foremost vulnerable populations, which generally means the um, low moderate income households. Um, we're talking people, um, populations with disabilities, populations that are elderly. It is really a, a, a relief program um, at its base for, um, for, for the vulnerable populations. So we released the survey, as I said, uh, we could go Friday. Uh, we, it is open to 2017 and 2018 disasters. We are doing a data collection exercise on the 2018 disasters uh, as we get out in front of doing their action plan uh, here shortly. Um, the 2017 disaster survey enables us to really finalize program guidelines and program design based on real-time data on the ground as of today um, and making sure that if there are things that, that rise to the forefront, um, such as a lot of um, landlords with small rentals that need assistance and are, would ultimately be willing to have an affordability covenant put on the property for a while. If, that is a, if that's a viable program, then that is something that we definitely want to look for. Um, additionally, if it turns out, um, we'll talk about again in a minute, we'll talk about the overall benefit, but if it turns out that the surveys show that we just don't have enough LMI to be able to meet the 70% requirement, we have to spend 70% of all the funding on the low mod vulnerable population um, um, beneficiaries, um, then there's a discussion about a waiver. Do, do we, for this grant for the state, need a waiver in order to lower that amount? Um, just, but we have to obviously prove that we've assisted all of the possibilities for, the, for low and moderate income um, beneficiaries as possible. And again, who we've talked about this, who should complete the survey? It's, it is anybody who sustained Im, impact, dis, destruction or impacts from the 2017 or 2018 fires. Um, those fires would be the October fires. Uh, in 2017, as we know, the December wildfires and mudflows in Southern California. And then in, for 2018, it would be the July and September wildfires and high winds in Lake and Shasta. That was, that was the devastating car fire. Um, as well as then, of course, the, the camp fire and uh, two fires in Los Angeles and Ventura again. You will, it's probably not lost on anyone that everyone who has sustained damage in 2018 um, also sustained damage in 2017, same counties. Seems to be a pattern. So this is the overall benefit piece that I was talking about earlier. You'll see on the multifamily, it's the, third, the second line down, the multifamily amount allocation is, is almost $67 million. That's 53, almost 54% of the grant. And that's 100% of the low mod benefit. So that's 100% um, to, of, of that funding. So it'd be 53% of the funding toward the total 70% we have to spend for low and moderate income benefit. The second bullet up there shows you that in addition to that, we've got to spend at least $20.1 million 
or, or another 16.21% of the funding on low mod benefit in order to hit the 70%. Lastly, the overall benefit of the survey um, is again so that we can have real-time data uh, from ground truthing what we believe to be happening, understanding and being responsive to what's really going on on the ground. Um, and then ultimately, as I said, should the data show that 70% is not achievable, then we go back to the drawing table with HUD. We have the data to drive the conversation with HUD in terms of asking for waivers if needed. and. Um, and, and we get to work on that request as soon as possible once the survey is completed. Currently, the survey, the first round of survey, this survey will be open until early January. Um, we are finalizing program design. We don't have the owner-occupied program completely designed yet because we need to see what the needs are, what the income levels are, um, whether there's mostly people who need to fully rebuild or there's people who just need the gap to get completed. Um, those are, those are two different scenarios and, and, um, and the, the survey will give us that information. So this is just a contact slide for us. If anyone needs to reach us, this is how, how you can reach us. That is my direct phone number and my direct email up there. Uh, also, full disclosure, the disaster recovery email comes directly to me too. So I have been conversing with um, many of the disaster survivors uh, since the disaster and now going live with the survey. We're helping people fill out surveys. Um, we've been on, um, uh, like I said, on the phone and on email with everybody helping people to, to fulfill their, their survey needs and answer any questions that they might have. All right, and with that, then I would switch to the handout that council members all have. This is the frequently asked questions. This incorporates questions we've been getting. And are those available to the public up above? There are some available to the public up above, and I'm sure they'll be posted online. We're gonna post them on our, uh, on our website. They are hot off the press today. Um, are there any specific questions or? Would you like to go through them? I'm happy to do whatever works best. So, Council, uh, and I'll actually, Council Member Combs, do you have any questions? I'm on mute, um, so it takes me a second to get back. No, I'm good, thank you for the report. All right, Council Member Tibbetts. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's one question that I had is, uh, Actually, I have a few. So it sounds like you, you will be setting the income limits based on this survey. We don't, or is there currently an established limit for somebody? Could you share on that? There's no established limit there. HUD has defined um, low mod uh, income definitions by census track. We, those are the definitions we have to use. Okay. They, they publish those. And the survey asks general, we don't get down to what people actually make. It's really just a range. And, um, and so ultimately we can assist above 80% um, of area median income uh, adjusted for family size. That's mm -hmm. the definition of low mod, 80% and below. Okay. Um, HUD understands that we are not sure how many people can really afford to own a home at 80% of AMI in California since it's such a high cost state. We know that there are some, thankfully, so we will be able to assist some, but the question is whether or not we can really hit that overall benefit number or, or whether we need to really bring um, a special circumstance to HUD. And what, what are the types of assistance or benefits that people should expect? So ultimately, we, what we are assisting with is construction costs. Um, you'll see in the frequently asked questions, it, the, what we can pay for really are um, our standard building construction, standard materials, mm -hmm. um, other than uh, on the interior, then on the exterior, it would be anything that is up to uh, WUI compliance, so the wildland urban interface, which is ignition resistant construction materials for the exteriors, uh, we can assist with that. Um, anything that is required by code um, uh, and green building standards, we then they can, the, the program can pay for. Okay, and if you don't hit the 70% threshold that you're looking for, although I suspect in this community you will, although 80%, oh. you're right, is, um, that's, that's considered, I mean, for all intents and purposes, that's lower income around here, it is. sadly. 
Um, but if you don't hit the 70%, will you look to increase? Do you have any ability to increase that threshold? So uh, with the 70% of LMI, what we'd want to do is lower it. So we'd want to be, we'd want to be able to help more people of, with more income as opposed to increasing the, the low mod number. We certainly have to ensure, HUD's not going to entertain it unless we know and we've done the due diligence that, that the vulnerable populations have been served and we're going to have to document how they've been served mm -hmm. um, uh, for the disaster survivors. So that will, be, that will be a big piece of that. But ultimately, right now, we can serve higher incomes as well. There isn't a requirement that we only serve 80%, we just have to make sure that they do get served first, um, first and then um, and that and that we are hit, we are mindful of that overall benefit requirement and whether or not we can hit it. It's sort of a juggling act to be completely honest with you right now. Sure. And one question I have, has HCD or HUD had a discussion about, I mean, when you look at the cost for building right now, yeah. being what it is per square foot, providing that money in the form of financial support to buy a home within the community somewhere else? So um, I think the... Calhoun program has first time ha, is waiving the first time requirement, but there the Calhoun program will help with purchases. That is a program that we will we if the survey comes back and people are saying that some of the things they want they don't want to rebuild, then that then that is something that we can look at. There's nothing prohibiting prohibiting us from this from from purchases. The um, what we heard in the original public meetings is that people did want to rebuild, so that's mm -hmm. why we've gone down this road. And and you know the to be completely honest, we all we all know this, but the 124 million that we were given is not enough. Mm -hmm. um, it is not enough for Santa Rosa. It is not enough for the entire state with which it's got to right. be delivered. So um, I think all those options can be on the table as we go forward with them. And find out what the survey is, what the survey says. Great. Yeah, my hope would be is that people who want to be rebuild would be able to. But looking at those cost efficiencies too for people who may not want to you know, continue the timeline of new construction, that yeah. that option be available. Understood, yes, and I, don't, I completely agree. Thank you. C Council member, I just want to assure you that we have raised these issues repeatedly with the state and with mm -hmm. the federal government. Um, uh, staff is a little frustrated on the timing here. We feel that this should have been out there way ahead of the timetable that we're currently on. But I want to assure you as members of the ad hoc can attest that these have been questions that have been, we've been repeatedly asked of our state agency partners and our federal partners. Thanks, Sean. And thank you, Vice Mayor. Council Member Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, so what I'm trying to understand here, I understand this is a different pot of money than um, what what um, our residents might have applied for before at the 80% AMI. Um, when you say census tract, does that mean um, national AMI or an AMI that's more localized to our area here? It's it's your individual census tracts. There's so last time, um, I'm not sure if it was used, if we used our census tract, that's a question for the city manager. Did we use our census tract when we went through the, or for you, Mr. Gwine, went through the um, SBA program? Well, you, do you mean, Cal Home? Cal, yes. Excuse me. yes, we did. So um, by way of background and very briefly, a, a, a program we applied for called Cal Home through state HCD would allow property owners to rebuild after the disaster. That was why we put, submitted the grant. With the data we received, we showed that we only had one qualified applicant at 80%, so we were successful in getting HCD to agree to go to 120% of area median income, but we still are waiting for our contract to be executed so we can push that news out. We were talking about if we have an owner-occupant survey going out to uh, Households who are impacted by the 2017 disaster, we certainly want to promote at the same time our Cal Home program going up to 120%. So, but what I'm trying to understand here is, is the 80% um, that we used before with the Cal Home program also based on the census tract, is the same 80% AMI? Yeah, area meeting income is, is, is provided through census tract by HUD, so it's representative of the North Bay here. So what I'm trying to get at here is the how how long a survey would take because our residents have been two years out now. We had our city did extensive re, you know um, outreach and we found one family that 
might could have qualified, but in the end didn't really. Mm -hmm. And so I'm reluctant. I want people to apply, but I don't want to ask people to engage in yet another, you know, Sisyphean uphill battle that feels like just one more thing that we thought might help and it doesn't in the end do anything. So what can you say to help me convince my constituents to apply for this? That ultimately the survey is the first step that we won't know exactly what the data shows us until it comes in. We understand that there is a, um, that 80% of AMI is really low to own a home in most counties, never mind Sonoma. And, and we're well aware of that. We've had these conversations internally. We're having this conversation with HUD. It is truly something on our radar. We can help people above 80% mm -hmm. of AMI. We simply have to make sure that we hit that, um, that we hit that that 70 percent. The one thing I, I do want to I do want to talk about, however, is in in the FAQs where it talks about what we can pay for. We just want to make sure everybody understands that that standard grade finishes is may not be exactly what most higher income homeowners are looking for, and that is all that this can pay for. This can't pay for anything that's luxury. It may not even be able to pay for granite. We will be looking into that, um, but it is, it is definitely geared toward um, moderate housing and, um, and the, the regulations and the requirements say that. Where we really can come in and make a difference, obviously, is in the exterior and the cementitious ignition resistant assistance. Okay, um, just as a, a general sense, about how long yes, would it take for um, a, an applicant to fill out the survey? Um, the applicants are generally taking, I want to say, about 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, that's not too long. That's pretty good to hear. I, it is, go ahead. It, basically, it is, it is the questions an application would ask. It just doesn't require any documentation at this point. Okay, thank you. I want to um, thank you for your presentation and hope that your conversations with HUD are, are more fruitful than, than mine have been. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I, I, I want to drill down a little bit on one of the questions that was asked that I didn't hear a, a good answer to. Okay. A, at what point can our constituents start to be able to rely on this assistance? So we expect to be able to take full applications into the system in hopefully early January. Um, that's the anticipated time. Um, you'll see on here it says early 2020, but I'm pushing people very hard in order to try to get this out in January. Um, we understand that it's all taken too long. We understand that, and even HUD agrees, like I said, we didn't get our grant agreement until August, so we couldn't go out for procurement on everything we had to do. So we are jamming people to get done what needs to get done. We will, we will push as hard as we can. Once someone fills out an application, then, then the process truly begins of property inspection. They have to stop work. There is some things that get, in, that get involved. Um, but we're hoping to have a turnkey situation where, a turnkey surface, where um, if someone hasn't started to rebuild or they want to use, they're done with their contractor and they want to use our contractor, then it's probable that they could come in and use ours and we will stand that up as quickly as possible. We will have estimators on staff. We will actually have contractors that are on, that are, uh, procured already and they're ready to come in and take on these projects and do them. There's no waiting for contractors. There's no, there's no have the homeowner having to go in and figure out who can do this for them. It will, uh, it will move far, far more smoothly through our system. We have case managers that when the owner occupied program manager comes on board, um, they will bring case managers with them so that the minute someone sub submits an application, is invited to submit an application, they submit the application, there is a case manager, there's a single point of contact that that homeowner will have through the entire process to help walk them through everything that needs done, whether it's title issues, whether it is simply, you know, ensuring that the two-party check to the contractor and the homeowner got delivered on time um, and is being processed correctly, those sorts of things. But there will be, there, there will be ample help for each of the homeowners that want to walk through this process with us. So if the applications are taken in, in January, when can our residents expect the assistance to actually reach them to be able to move forward? That would depend on how long the, the construction takes. But, the, but within a week, someone's going to be out there doing the assessment, someone's going to be out there doing the, um, putting the scope of work together, but they will, from the time that they see the, that we receive the application and the application is processed, 
that within, within a week of understanding that the application is um, eligible and ready to go, I would say within I, a week. I think the, the key variable I'm trying to get at is once the application comes in, how long is it going to take them to be verified to be able to receive that assistance? Because from what I'm hearing, they're gonna put things on hold while they wait until they have all their ducks in a row, make sure that they get that assistance. So I don't want people waiting the, the on the expectation they're gonna get the assistance if it doesn't come in. The assistance will be will be available as soon as the application is complete. There's quite a bit of documentation that we're going to have to assist them through uploading and and putting into the system. Um, but I can't imagine that it's if we are going to have enough case managers based on the number of surveys and the number of respondents that we get. I can't imagine that it's going to be more than a week or two before somebody's out there making sure that they are doing the inspections making sure that they're making contact with the homeowners, making sure that the estimates are being done. Estimates will be put into an electronic system so that they are all um, equal. It, we don't have the system yet, but it'd be something similar probably to an Xactimate. Not sure if you're familiar with that system or not, but it will talk directly to the owner-occupied program that we have and upload everything electronically. The more paper you have, the slower it goes. One of the reasons we wanted to put this into an electronic format is so that it could go faster. But it's an electronic format that we can assist people with because not everybody has access to computers and not everybody has access to um, the internet. And so we also can do this over the phone. There will be case managers, like I said, that can do it over the phone for, for homeowners. I can't guarantee a time, however, but the, but the turn time, in my mind, is no more than a week or two before we really get rolling. And it would only be two weeks in the event that we got a rush of, of applicants all at the same time. Okay, and I appreciate that. And I think you're just hearing a sense of urgency from the council, Understood. understanding that we're trying to help the most vulnerable folks who are also now seeing their ALE having expired yes. and having a hard time already staying in our community. Why was the plan designed around income and not based on what we're seeing as a gap in the cost to rebuild a home versus what the insurance will pay? Those are the federal requirements because okay. it is federal money and it is, and it, it again, the, the, the basis for this program and the money is to assist for low and moderate income people with disaster. It's disaster relief as opposed to recovery. Um, and so, and, and as HUD has always said, it's a down payment on recovery essentially. So in their minds, it is really about disaster relief to the most vulnerable populations to try to restabilize where um, restabilize them after a disaster. And then the next logical question is then why does it take two years to get the money out? And I do not disagree. Yeah, I think, I think the unfortunate uh, fear that I have and I know other council members have is that at this point it's too late in our community to get these dollars out to actually help the people that they're intended for, but I appreciate the efforts of getting that out. Mr. McGlynn. Uh, so uh, I think s the city staff understands the community's frustration with the process. Um, I want to assure you we've been advocating for a faster delivery of, of these, this survey uh, and the com corresponding data, but I have to urge the community to complete the survey. Um, there have been and in, in, uh, frequently are, um, although this state is somewhat resistant to it, action plan revisions. This is, does not have to be the end of the conversation, but without the data, it's gonna be hard pressed for the city to make an argument to revise the intended investments. So we would urge as staff, and we would ask you as council to urge folks to who have been impacted by this disaster to complete the survey. It is only, um, as, as Ms. Naramore said, it is only 10 to 15 minutes long. And we, can, we, we, we will be expecting the state to share the aggregated data with us understand where that is and how the program is developing so that we can, as a community, um, argue for potentially adjusting um, how the action plan is delivering resources to communities across the state. All right, thank you, Mr. McGlynn. Last question I had, I noticed you said in there that you've hired seven staff members and executed a number of contracts. Was there a line item in the CDBG DR for that type of staffing, or does that come from the state specifically? Some of the contracting is state funding. Um, the other, the other 
staff is going to be a mix of activity delivery and some admin for those working on monitoring across all the programs. That's gonna be administration, pretty much everybody else working directly on like our homeowner manager, our, our housing manager, our housing staff person, that's pretty much project delivery because they're delivering the project. Okay, great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Council, any other questions? All right. You think? Thank you. All right, city manager and city attorney reports. Who wants to go first? I have nothing to report. I have nothing to report as well. Okay. All right. Statements of abstention from council members. Council member Tibbetts. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, so I will be abstaining from item 14.1 uh, due to the inclusion of AB 2152 and its ratification and how that impacts a project I'm working on on Mendocino Avenue, uh, specifically the gold coin. Um, and that's it for me from now. Okay. Any others? I will be recusing from the motion on the minute. Okay. Councilmember Fleming. I will be recusing from the motion on the minutes. Okay. All right, we will move on now to council members' uh, reports. Who wants to begin? Council Member Tibbetts. All right, thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I wanted to recently, or actually bring to this council and staff's attention that uh, the subcommittee within the Oakmont Village Association out in Oakmont is currently working on the development of a pilot program microgrid uh, in that community. Um, and it's something that they see could become a model for other areas throughout the community as well as throughout the state of California. Uh, they're currently in conversations and beginning to develop a partnership with Sonoma Clean Power. And the reason why I bring it to our attention is number one, we have a climate action subcommittee that may want to be tracking this and working with uh, the Oakmont Village Association on it. But number two, just to bring it to their attention, they're gonna need partners at the state level, the local level, and certainly with our, our energy authority, Sonoma Clean Power. So when it comes time for permitting, I'm hoping that we can um, be a good partner to Oakmont and help them get what they need to get that microgrid off the ground and hopefully get some good results for the rest of the state. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Fleming. I just wanted to note that typically after a holiday, we take um, a council day off and I wanted to let our veterans know that we as a council and I in particular appreciate their service and I'm really grateful for everything they did and that we had a really stacked calendar and um, that please not let this meeting uh, act as any way um, to subvert how much we appreciate your service and um, you're, are grateful as a community. Thank you. Council Member Oliveras. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. A quick report on last week's downtown subcommittee meeting, a well-attended meeting. Uh, a lot of the attendees expressed uh, their concerns and their continued efforts in recovery as well with all the incidents that we've been going through the last couple of weeks. Uh, we do hope to bring a recommendation related to the restroom. Uh, I believe, I think, I think in December we'll be bringing that back for recommendation. Uh, and you'll also be getting a study session soon related to parking. And uh, then on a second item, and I guess this is directed to the city manager, city attorney, just for some clarification or some help, because I don't know where to go with this. But there have been, uh, and this relates to the council quorums that we've been dealing with lately. I've uh, been hearing a lot of information, the community and concerns that we do not have a full council. Uh, I, I know that uh, there have been stories about council member Combs moving. Uh, what I'm hearing is that she has actually vacated her home and moved out of the country. So I don't know how that's being communicated to you, whether you're working with her or not, but it seems to be out there and I don't have answers. So could you two please work with her and find out what her intent is, whether she intends to continue serving on this council or not, uh, so that we can prepare for this, because as you saw tonight, we had to postpone an item, and we have a lot of uh, critical issues that we're gonna be facing and making decisions on here in the very near future that's gonna require some full attention. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. 
so I had a chance uh, to go out this weekend for the uh, Winter Blast Festival put on by Out There Santa Rosa and the SOFA Parade. So just wanted to say a huge thank you to everybody who was involved in that one. Uh, I think next year I'm going to try to build a uh, SOFA float and we'll see how that one goes. Uh, I also had a chance yesterday to go to the Rotary Salute to Veterans uh, that was done up in Healdsburg. Uh, 50 years ago, the Vietnam War was at its height with almost 450,000 Americans committed to the effort and 59 folks from Sonoma County did not make it home from that. So it was a very heartwarming uh, discussion about POWs and, and MIA uh, moving forward. So uh, just wanted to disclose that as well. We'll move on to item number 10, approval of the minutes. You have the November 1st, 2019 special meeting minutes available to the public. Uh, I heard that Council Member Combs and Council Members Fleming have to abstain from this item. Uh, for the other Council Members who were present, were there any changes to the minutes? Seeing none, we'll show those as adopted, uh, four to zero. We'll move on to the consent calendar. Mr. McGlynn. Item 11.1. Ordinance Adoption Second Reading, South Park Rezone for General Plan Consistency, Ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code, reclassification of 34 properties located at 900 and 910 Santa Rosa Avenue, 920, 930, 940, 950, 964, 972, 1014, 1026, 1038, 1110-1212-1240-1310-1316-1320-1400-1426-1452-1540-1576-1580 Petaluma Hill Road, 625 Ware Avenue, Assessor's Parcel Number 038-155-016 no street address assigned, 612 Frazier Avenue, 611, 612, and 628 Milton Street, 636 and 1341 Rutledge Avenue, and 1614, 1618, and 1630 Aston Avenue to the CG General Commercial Zoning District, file number PRJ18-055. And I got to read that uh, recommendation last week. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, uh, it was. <laughs> Council, uh, are there uh, any cards? Okay, go ahead, Council Member Sawyer. Mr. Vice Mayor, um, due to my absence, I may, sh I, should I be recused abstaining from this second reading, Madam City Attorney? Uh, unless you um, listened um, to the earlier hearing, public hearing, I would recommend that you recuse. All right, I will, I'll be abstaining then from, um, from this item. All right, seeing no questions. I believe that I will need to abstain from the item as well. Okay, Council Member Tibbetts, I'm gonna come to you for a motion. I move items uh, on the consent calendar and wait for the reading of the text. Second. Uh, and because we have the uh, voice in the sky tonight, all votes will be vo by voice vote uh, so that the public can hear as well. So Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Thank you. Council Member, Vice Mayor Rogers. Aye. Julie Combs, you will be abstaining. Correct. Council Member Fleming. Aye. Council Member Olivares? Aye. Council Member Sawyer abstaining? Correct. Council Member Tibbetts? Aye. All right, and that will pass with four ayes and two abstentions, as well as one absence. Uh, we'll move on to uh, the public comment for non agenda items. Uh, just as a as a reminder, while folks get situated in this, we will be moving item 14.4 from tonight's agenda to next Tuesday's agenda. Uh, we have two council members who need to recuse and we are required to have a quorum uh, in the jurisdiction to be able to hear it. So we will be moving item 14.4. If you are here, I apologize. Uh, first for non-agenda items, uh, Peter Chernoff, followed by Dwayne DeWitt.
Great news. Um, this third public meeting for this topic being introduced. I'm sure you'll be all very excited for the Homeless Literary uh, Overnight uh, Refuge Program, knowing that the Sonoma County Library has a uh, surplus at this moment of $12 million. I'm sure they can uh, work something out uh, with any number of locations, like perhaps St. Vincent's, for an overnight uh, book study uh, and coffee, because that'd be a nice place to be as opposed to the cold or the rain for the homeless. The California power comes to flower. The authority be mine to say as I do, as all true pure spirit warriors possess the authority to make this come true. Commanding all veterans, law enforcement, firefighters, all labor, all students, all farmers, all growers, seed sowers, flamethrowers, and charmers, commanded you be for all the world to see. Abide, no mortgages, no rents, no labor, no schools. No longer be we the usurious bankers fools, the bankers that maintain all the wars and oil tankers. I am Peter, I am the brother from the East. You will join this 40 day teacher strike and all corruptions forever ceased. This almighty action through me commanded till every need of the earth, mother earth be remanded. For behind every war, foreign and domestic, been the slaughterhouse and the oil blood flow, now ceased as we become and arise majestic. Patriarchal religious deceivers have always undermined the faith of true believers. Yahushua, the one they called Jesus in this country, was always a vegan, an Essene, and murdered, always included uh, uh, from the commandments from the time of Moses. And we've all been lied to, and that's undermined us all. Overcome the greatest boycott with the mother of all that be the call. Freeze frame now the entire West Coast till DC and Wall Street corruption is toast. All unions unite under the US Constitution with the CSPOA, the Constitutional Sheriff's Peace Officers Association. The sheriff is the top law enforcement of the land thereby extricating usurious bankers and their bar lawyerly minions. For lawyers have always caused problems for the unions as they serve their masters, the shareholders and owners. And so, to embark then with 10 million gardens with artists and musicians, these things come now to pass as they be commanded here and now under this beautiful moon they truly be our serious tune, our highest tune. Shade, Shade, Adonai, Shade, a beautiful action, a beautiful day. Abracadabra, create as I speak, say. I say it, you hear it, so be it, it's already done. Under this full moon, our beautiful tune, we overcome as one. Thank you so much, so much Mr. Trump. We missed you. Glad to have you back. Dwayne DeWitt, and Dwayne will be followed by Lisa Landris. Hello, <clears throat> my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from uh, Roseland, and I wanted to thank you, the two of you that mentioned Veterans Day, which was yesterday. And I always think of November as a Thanksgiving month, a month in which to try to give thanks for positive things. Yesterday, there was a Veterans Day celebration held in Santa Rosa. It wasn't the one that was held here traditionally for a number of years. It was over at the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors. There was probably about 40 veterans there, and a sizable number of them asked what was going on with our approach to try to get the Veterans Trail, the Veterans Healing Garden, the Veterans Grove in Roseland. A letter was written to you over a year ago from our Congressman Mike Thompson, a veteran, stating that they wanted us veterans, I should say, specifically the Vietnam Veterans of America post 223, was hoping to get the support from the city to move forward on this. Never got any response. And so at yesterday's celebration, if you will, of our patriotism and the people who've given their lives to keep this forum alive, if you will. It was mentioned by a few that it seems at times that various elected officials will wave a flag and speak fondly of veterans, but then when it comes time to have the rubber meet the road, it's going nowhere. 
I appreciate Ms. Fleming's reference to the Sisyphean tasks that go on in life. And for us veterans in Sonoma County, it seems like a Sisyphean task to just get you to do something for veterans that's an actual activity. It's an undertaking that we can see rather than wave a flag and say, thanks, we're there for you. Specifically in the past, we came forward and pointed out that the taxpayers were the proud owners of some houses over in Roseland where three Roseland members died in the Vietnam War that was mentioned earlier. And we thought, well, we're gonna work together with people at the city and get a way to commemorate things and we could get those houses and we could perhaps work together, move them away instead of destroy them. And instead, taxpayers' money down the drain. They were demolished. So now that there's nothing there, there shouldn't be any holdup. I don't see that there should be a difficulty in letting veterans go forward volunteering our time and our efforts to get that veterans trail in that was first proposed decades ago. You know, this clock up here doesn't do the countdown anymore. We'll see so if, if we can fix that. that. If you're gonna have that, uh, what's that buzzer sound? Thank, thank you, Mr. DeWitt, we'll you try to fix that. You should at least give us the clock for the timing. And I pledge allegiance to America. Lisa thank Landris, you. followed by Gregory Fearon. put on next door trying to get um, some folks to come downtown and support our local merchants, restaurants, retailers. Um, it's kind of become a ghost town many times. There's a couple of exciting places that have a little action, but as I drive through downtown, it's gotten pretty sad downtown. So I posted a little uh, item on there that said, please support our downtown, please go down there. They are us, you know, we need your dollars downtown. I got 160 comments and reactions. 95% of the comments were very fiercely in opposition to the parking meter system. And the complaints ranged from the variety of parking meters, the time on the parking meters, poor lighting so they couldn't see the parking meters. Um, there was every kind of problem associated with it. Some restaurateurs even cited that they didn't know that every five-star review would come with a, a ticket and that they had heard from so many of their patrons in their restaurant because they couldn't even see that the parking thing said until eight o'clock at night. So people unfamiliar with the eight o'clock rule were given their $35 tickets along with the ride for dinner. So um, some of the following um, other items that were important to people, homelessness was the second uh, precursor of why they don't want to come. That was an obstacle for people. They said um, more homeless people than there were patrons for the downtown. Felt uncomfortable with the presence of people with so many large items, all of that. Uh, they were really unhappy with our town square. That was the third item that people, I didn't know that they detested it so much. To me, I've always thought it looks like a helicopter meta flight pad. But people say that they actually go to Windsor, Petaluma and Healdsburg to have a downtown experience. That's how much they hate our downtown and how it looks. So I'll read you just until I run out of time. I promised people I would read a couple of their comments. <clears throat> uh, let's see. I don't find any friendly atmosphere there at all. The merchants are all friendly and need our business, but I don't enjoy the experience at all. I've heard merchants say that the new restored eyesore of a square is hurting their business. Such ugliness does nothing for our city. It seems like it was only built as a way to generate profits for somebody else. Well, it's um, just an observation. I'm originally from San Francisco, so parking meters, garages aren't new to me. The difference is that the need and desire to be there outweighs the cost in San Francisco. That isn't the case with Santa Rosa. I enjoy many places downtown, but I don't need to go there. Um, next person reports that they park on side streets to totally avoid coming here, even though they do participate in the downtown. Used to be a great place to stroll and window shop, stop for a sidewalk meal, then the city got involved. It is now an attractive place to go. Thank you, Lisa. Thank Gregory Fearon, followed by Tony Giraldi. Son? 
Thank you, Vice Mayor Rogers and members of the council. Tonight I'm here to advocate on behalf of the people out of Joe Redota Trail. We had a meeting on Saturday, uh, homeless action with them and are assisting them in developing self-governance and addressing the issues that they identify. One of the issues that they identified uh, was the dumping of uh, what people think are something people could use on the trail. Uh, and I have a hard time believing, you know, some of the things that are dumped there would in anyone's mind be good for the people on the trail. I think it's becoming just a place everybody in the city who wants to dump cr trash starts dumping. Uh, and this, certainly the people on the trail have seen that and they said that to us. Uh, they also said it used to be in the early days, and I, I don't know what early days of the trail are, but the early days of when they were there, that the police actually cracked down on those people who came by and dumped shit. They went and looked at stuff, they figured out who it was, and they put pressure on them. And it stopped for a little while, and then it went away. Nobody, from their point of view, is trying to prevent people from dumping right behind those stores, right next to the trail, stuff they have no ability to get rid of, don't want, and feel that people are really just dumping on them. Uh, so I'm here to recommend and to ask the city to do something like it used to do when they were all under the uh, underpass. We had a partnership with the city. The city staff uh, in utilities and others came out on a every two week basis. We worked with them and we cleaned up some of the stuff that was there. It's not happening at Joe Redota and you know why. Everybody seems to have this attitude that I've talked to in the city that says, if we do anything at all, we're gonna send a big signal that says it's okay to be there. That is so inhumane. There are people out there who really need your help. There are people in the community trying to help them and we need your help too. Try to find something you can do. I've almost given up asking you guys to think about porta potties and washing stations and things that really are humane. And from a public health point of view, you should have been doing a long time ago. But please, garbage, you can do that. You can send your staff out on a two week basis like they used to with a, you know, one of those trash bins that will help fill up and they can take away. It can't be that difficult. You've done an awful lot for people who've been, you know, damaged by the fire. Do a little more for these folks. Thank you, Gregory. Tony Giraldi, followed by Deborah. Uh, Tony Giraldi, uh, proud center as a resident, uh, residing at 680 Elsa Drive and General Operations Manager, Sonoma County Airport Express. Uh, good evening, uh, Vice Mayor Rogers and distinguished members of the City Council. It's my understanding the city of Santa Rosa employs over 1,000 people organized in the 13 departments with nearly 180,000 residents living within the city limits. With this in mind, the responsibilities and the time commitments of our city council members are no, are no doubt monumental. We certainly need all seven of our council members to be fully engaged, uh, constantly interacting with residents and city staff, uh, with that in mind, I have major concerns when one of our council members is now living outside of our city, outside of our state, outside of our country, in Ecuador. How can council member Combs be considered a true representative of our beloved community when she no longer lives here? How can council member Combs attend important community functions? How can she visit areas of concern within our city? How can she fully engage with our business community? our homeless community, and areas recently affected by our fires. We have serious issues needing to be addressed here in Santa Rosa, issues whereby face-to-face -face dialogue needs to happen with our entire council engaged. To Council Member Combs, I respectfully ask you to move back to Santa Rosa. If not, do what's right and please resign your seat on this council. Make this decision now and do this under your term. If you've already decided to remain in Ecuador, then we do, do what our community is owed and what is right, resign your seat. If you do not make a decision extremely soon, again, under your terms, I would suggest your colleagues here in Santa Rosa do what they can to force a resignation or, re resignation or remove you as a council member of the city of Santa Rosa. A resident of Ecuador is not a representative of the Santa Rosa community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Giraldi. Deborah, followed by Kim Schroeder. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Deborah Tavares with StompTheCrime.net. I have uh, several comments. Uh, my husband uh, was a veteran in Vietnam. He was on the Oriskany that went to go help those on the Forrestal when the Forrestal nearly sunk that year in 1967. He didn't know what he now knows about having served in the military because he hadn't read Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars. So for any of you sitting here right now, if you have not read Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars, page 42, 43, and 44, I would ask for you to do so. It is eye-opening and it is your reality and it is extremely important. Secondly, I want to talk about the PACE loans that I have found out are extremely predatory. What I have learned about the PACE loans, which are loans that this city council has, a, has approved here in Santa Rosa for augmenting energy upgrades. And PACE is a Rockefeller Rothschild loan program, extremely predatory. There has been legislation in DC about the predatory nature of these loans. Though your homes can be foreclosed upon in 60 days because these loans become an, a line item on your property taxes. You have to hire a PACE approved contractor to augment your uh, change out to electric if you're going to change out of gas or if you're gonna add insulation or if you're gonna add dual pane windows. You will also be uh, unable to uh, pay ahead of time because it's a prepayment penalty. If you do not, uh, and if you're in a disaster area and your income is hit, you can uh, change the payments of your property taxes with the county tax assessor, but you cannot with PACE. PACE will foreclose on your home in 60 days. I have a recording of this conversation with PACE on StopTheCrime.net on our YouTube video channel that will be posted tomorrow. This is hair raising, this is horrific, and this is what this de facto corporate structure has approved for all of you. Again, the PACE loans are very, very predatory. As far as the homelessness, we are watching concentration camps being accepted on our streets. We're watching people, human beings, as they would be left as a POW overseas during a war on our streets. We're becoming desensitized to what we're observing on our streets. And these people have no jurisdiction. Thank That's so why much, it Deborah. remains. Thank you. Kim, Kim Schroeder. You're all asleep. You're not paying attention. Peter, come on, Peter. It is the audience and those on the TV. Peter. All right, we're going to take a five-minute recess, and we'll come back.
folks, if you can file in quietly, we'll get started here. Sorry for the uh, little delay, but it did give Council Member Oliveris a chance to grab a snack. So traditionally, we only take 10 public comment cards for the first public comment period. We have 12 cards, so with my discretion, I'm going to do all 12 before we move on to the next item. Any new cards that come in after that fact, we'll take at the end of the meeting in the second public comment period. So I do believe that it was... Okay, and Council Member Combs is still with us on the phone, uh, so she will help us to establish our quorum here briefly. Uh, Kim Schroeder, and she'll be followed by Alan Thomas. Go ahead, Kim. Good evening, Council. My name is Kim Schroeder, and I'm a San Jose native and a parent at Montgomery High School since 2012. In December 2014, Verizon submitted an application with the city to place a cell tower in Montgomery's football stadium. In January 2015, a public hearing was requested. There was public concern, and the application was pulled. Come to find out in early 2018, a 4G cell phone tower with 5G infrastructure was placed right in front of Montgomery High School. No public's notice this time. Verizon found a way to put it in the public right of way. With equipment and transformers on power lines all over, the cell tower went unnoticed for a long time. Not even our principal staff or possibly even the district knew it was there. How is this okay? Parents and staff have a right to know it's there. This is extremely upsetting to me and other Montgomery parents. Montgomery said no thank you to a tower on campus before. There was absolutely no consideration for our concern for our children and school staff when Verizon proceeded to place one there anyway. It's actually closer to our classrooms in the heart of campus and the football stadium. During my eight years being a Montgomery parent, not once have I heard complaints about cell service. I understand it had five bars before the tower went in. The cell tower has powerful antennas and is way too close to where our kids are hanging out. Since the FCC limits are from 1996, they're based on acute thermal effects and not 24-7 exposure with current technology, telecom can emit extremely high levels of radio frequency, microwave radiation, and still be compliant. Why on earth does Verizon need a 4G tower there just to speed up video streaming and social media? At a high school campus, for that matter, it's not about 911 calls or critical Nixle alerts. A few other parents and I were on campus with radiation meter the other day. The elect electromagnetic frequency was highest near the tower, of course, which, by the way, is where so many kids hang out right there on the front lawn over snack break, lunch, after school, sprawled out enjoying their conversations, and it's a main walkway into campus, a lot of foot traffic. A very strong signal continued within a 1,500 foot radius. Independent scientific studies all over the world have linked several health issues to radio frequency microwave radiation, and studies paid for by the telecom industry will tell you not so much. This explains why so many cities in California and all over the world are prohibiting cell towers near schools, parks, neighborhoods, medical facilities, etc. Our precious children and staff are peppered with this radiation every day, all school day long. Maria Creo, Proctor Terrace, and Lincoln Elementary have towers too close by. The these parents and staff have a right to know. Aside from headaches, anxiety, depression, brain fog, what if worst case people start getting sick on these campuses like they did at Reapin Elementary in Modesto? Eight cases of cancer so far. I know the city doesn't want this liability. There are recent federal court rulings that help cities be in a better position with the telecom industry. I welcome the opportunity to work with you and figure out a solution for effective technology without compromising the health and environment of our community. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, Kim. Uh, and just because we do have a couple of new faces in the audience, uh, due to the Brown Act, we actually can't engage in a back and forth conversation on an issue brought up a non-agenda items, but I will say, check the agenda. That yeah. discussion is coming before the council. Yes, thank you. Alan Thomas, followed by Anita Lafalette. Well, thank you, Vice Mayor um, and Council. This is an old face. So um, I had spoken last week um, about you, you folks reaching out to the county uh, to do something with the Joe Rodota Trail and the illegal camping that's going on. I'd also recommended that you send a letter of support to the city of Boise, Idaho, who, um, as you know, in 2009, uh, there was Martin versus Boise, and it was in the court system for a long time. In April, the Ninth Circuit Court came out and basically ruled in favor, saying it was the Eighth Amendment um, violation, so that cities and the, and the Ninth Circuit could not, or counties for that matter, enforce their vagrancy laws. So um, I guess I have a question for you because I've done some research on this. I've, I've read 
the actual document. I would encourage all of you folks, and there's 33 um, different municipalities in the state of California, um, the city of Los Angeles, the city of Sacramento, the city of San Rafael, the county of Del Norte, um, the county of San Diego, the Vista, the city of Vista, they've all said, Supreme Court, please overturn this. Please overturn this because this is hamstringing our ability to, d to deliver any kind of public service. What happened tonight, just now, when we were all disrupted, um, is a perfect example of what's going on in Santa Rosa and the whole state of California. You have in individuals that don't have to listen to one minute regulations. They don't have to do whatever we all have to do. They can just do whatever you want. And for whatever reason, California leadership, including the people on the dais down there, um, feel more compelled to not just say no. It's not acceptable, sorry. You do that for other things, but you don't seem to do it for the general public. And I think people are starting to get a little frustrated. So I would ask you, I would urge you to read the friendly brief that was submitted to the Supreme Court back in September of this year. Basically read it, it explains everything. Why cities want you guys to enforce normal, standard quality limits so people aren't living outside. However you do it, that's up to you. But do something. So I was asked by one of the members of CAN to ask anybody in the room or anybody that supports CAN, which is the Citizens Action um, Group that's been formed after the whole debacle down at the Joe Rodoto Trail to raise their hand in support, just, you know, whatever. So I'm gonna raise my hand and whoever else wants to raise my hand and I, like a citizen, will adhere to your three minute limit. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Anita LaFollette, followed by Stephen Mosher. Good evening, I just wanted to remind you that there are a lot of people that are living out in this weather now and it's getting very cold. You know about Joe Rodota being out there. And we at Homeless Action have been meeting with them and we're trying to organize them and get together so that we could get some porta potties, garbage pickup, and uh, about the drop off of garbage behind uh, the, res the people there. So. I want you to pay attention to that because we have met with um, we have met with Kelly, and in fact, we are trying to put together the chat program so it makes sense, so that it's something we can use to be able to get the the, the things we need to be able to make that hospitable because it's going to start raining soon. I just want to make you know like. Hello, heads up, there's a lot of people that don't have a place to live. And I think that is probably truly a breakdown in our capitalistic system. And I want you to pay attention to that. And I want you to notice that there is a chat program that will help us if you would please do that instead of paying attention to those things like whether or not Certainly it's terrible when people have their homes burned down, but I see that your attention is all on that. Those are the big homeowners with a lot of money. It's not taking care of those that don't have any money and it shouldn't make us different. We are identical to people who have money. We're still people. We're still residents. You still have an obligation to us. And I also want to ask you a question. If you didn't take 14.2 uh, off, is Kiwanis Springs going to be affordable, all those new fancy homes over there? Because anybody know if any of those are affordable? Because they're going to just sit there like the ones that are up on Yalupa and over on Stony Point, and nobody can live in them because nobody can afford the rent. Okay, so you can't answer my question. You don't answer my question. You don't have any clue whether they're affordable. You let all those homes be built over there and you have no clue whether they're affordable, I'm sorry. 
it's, the council is not paying attention to me. Okay. Well then I'm not gonna talk to you anymore. Good night. Thank you, Anita. And again, public for the public uh, who have not been here before on non-agenda items, due to the Brown Act, we actually cannot engage in a back and forth because it has not been an agendized item and it deprives the public of a chance to be a part of the conversation. Stephen Mosher, followed by Craig Murphy. Yes, uh, Stephen Mosher from uh, Santa Rosa. I'm here to talk about the smart train and they just passed a resolution to put the, uh, uh, and put onto, the, onto the ballot next March tax extension for uh, ten, tax extension for 10 years early than stated in their very real term. That goes along with the time that we rejected the smart train at a half cent sales tax and then smart knew and lied thinking that a quarter cent would do it. Well, they did be far from the uh, the uh, the goal there. So what the rate face is with is uh, refinancing their bond debt to six million dollars a year from about twenty million dollars a year. Well, really, what we need is to pay off the bond debt, make them actually run a commuter train, not these all-day excursion trains to take Ann Martha to lunch with about three or four people on the train. It's supposed to be a commuter train. So why are we having all this, it, it, all this extra service? It's the only thing Smart's ever done that they did more of. Now, it's tam the timing's really interesting because they're, their um, budget is supposed to go up to $60 million in a year and a half uh, per year. It's about $40 million per year. I'm figuring that the, 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 the extra is they are going, going to have to, that's the pensions of the smart board members. And mo smart board members are a uh, uh, clueless lot, really, Vice Mayor Rogers, totally accepted. He's he's brand new on the board. He asks intelligence questions. In fact, he has asked a question about positive train control, which they got to get back to him. But no one on the board is, has a clue about what positive train control is. They just work out their packets and hope, oh, well, yes, oh, yes, hi, see ya. And then some kind of feather in their cap thing instead of running another real, real transit agency. So vote no next March, make smart, pay up the, pay up the bonds, and, uh, and start from there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moser. Craig Murphy, followed by Elizabeth Nalen. Hello, my name is Craig Murphy. With, I'm in Santa Rosa. Thanks for uh, hearing me out today. I'm going to start with an observation or a few observations followed by a few comments. Um, first of all, I've observed just yesterday driving uh, by the Joe Rodota Trail that now both sides of Stony Point Road are fully engulfed with encampments. It's gone all the way to the gates at the trail, whereas uh, a few weeks ago or last month when I was out on the trail uh, on a bike ride, I, I observed that it started 100 or so yards in, but it's definitely expanded. Um, this is, it seems that this is correlating to some effect to the, uh, the fires coming on. I, I believe that People take advantage of the fire services that we've had, we've had here in the county. Uh, and, and I think that people are coming from out of the area because there's far more people now than there were just a month ago. Um, I've also noticed more RVs that have moved back into my neighborhood uh, in the Montgomery Village area. Just, to, just this morning, I called on two dilapidated RVs that have been in place for more than five days in my neighborhood. Um, out of one of them, there was a, a dog that attacked a cyclist uh, this morning, I believe it was. So this is definitely an issue. Um, 
going along with, with the RVs, they are dumping their sewage tanks into storm drains. There's a, a dump station in the RV uh, park at the fairgrounds. They don't see these RVs, these folks that are homeless, that are living in their RVs, they don't see those RVs coming in to pay the $10 to dump their black water. Uh, so we know where they're, they're going. They're going into the storm drains, and that's a terrible ec environmental disaster for our creeks. So we're not going to solve this homeless issue overnight, so I would suggest on that issue that we issue uh, $10 vouchers to the folks living in these RVs, at least temporarily, so that they dispose of their wastewater properly. They can go to the RV park by the fairgrounds and dump them uh, rather than dumping them in the creeks, which is where it's going right now, or just in the in the gutter. Um, and then as far as uh, another issue that we are hearing a lot is the affordable housing argument. And of course, everybody wants affordable housing, but affordable housing will not impact 80% of the folks on the Joe Rodota Trail or in the other parks, Doyle Park or other encampments. Those folks have mental health issues and they have, uh, um, they have issues with drugs, and that needs to be treated at a much higher level, probably a federal level. I would ask you to reach out for federal assistance to deal with this problem. It's not going to be solved locally, but allowing it to continue and fester the way it is is definitely not a solution either. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Elizabeth Nealon. Elizabeth Nealon, nice to see all of you. Um, I recently uh, was holed up in the trauma unit for 24 days over at the hospital, and I got to watch the Gandhi movie in which he proclaimed that he knew a way out of hell. And I'm hoping this country will find that same way to get out of what I consider a living hell. Uh, I was born here. My mother was a socialist from Canada. But while I was, after I saw the Gandhi movie, I think I wrote a whole bunch of stuff down. And like, uh, I support the 40 day strike idea that Peter has to stop the US military fascism. Now, the Christian religion has been co-opted by depraved capitalists for many, many years. And they bought up our mass media. I would say that the Christian religion is a in a general state of decay due to its supremacist attitudes. Now, if you looked into the history of India, you, I think you would find that they have not gone to war in thousands of years. And they've had many awakened masters. Um, I would say that, um, it is time for extreme activism. Let's stop funding endless war. Uh, depraved capitalists threaten humanity's survival. Let's not be depraved, let's get real, you know. I, I'm really into that, like, cages and prisons are no place for kids. Close detention camps today. Welcome refugees. Unite all families, including the homeless. Now I have a homeless son in Berkeley. His name is D'Artagnan. And he was attacked by the Santa Rosa police during a medical emergency on February the 7th, 2015. He was suffering from a brain injury covered in blood, being a black man covered in blood. I'm sure it was easy to, to say, hey, you're drunk because we want to arrest you. They lost the records of his alcohol test when they went through the court system. And why did they lose them? Because he wasn't drunk. They just wanted to arrest him because he was a black man covered in blood. He was probably a bad guy. Of course, he has a master's degree from Stanford and the police of Berkeley call him professor because he was an assistant professor for five years at Stanford. So let's just remember, we're in a heck of a lot of deep, sh you know what, right here in America. And we need more activists on the street and, and the hell with capitalism. It's a ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and glad you're feeling better. Ah, uh, yes. I, I'm gonna bring it back to council. The uh, first public comment period is now closed. We have no report items tonight, so we will go on to item 14.1. Mr. McLean. 
Item 14.1, public hearing, objective design standards for streamlined and ministerial residential developments. Amy Nicholson, senior planner, presenting. Joined by Claire Hartman. Thank you, Vice Mayor Rogers and members of the council. The item before you is a zoning code text amendment establishing objective design standards for streamlined and ministerial residential developments pursuant to recent state legislation. The city has an existing policy document which covers residential and non-residential design known as the design guidelines. These guidelines are subjective to allow for discretion and flexibility. Therefore, they cannot be enforced through the state mandated process. The goal with these proposed objective design standards is to address neighborhood compatibility and ensure attractive residential development citywide while complying with new state legislation. Jurisdictions across the state are experiencing housing shortages and high costs. In an effort to address this issue, the state government has adopted a number of housing bills which require a streamlined and ministerial process for specified residential developments. Two bills which were the impetus for this zoning code text amendment include Senate Bill 35 and Assembly Bill 2162. These two bills discuss a streamlined and ministerial process, and streamlined in this context means that projects are processed within a specified time frame, and ministerial means no use of discretion or personal judgment. As additional legislation to expedite housing development within the state is anticipated, this zoning code text amendment has been written in a broad manner to apply to future projects which would require ministerial and streamlined review. Senate Bill 35 or SB 35 became law in January of 2018. It was part of a housing bill package signed by the governor and requires that streamlined ministerial process. This bill is only uh, required for jurisdictions which are not meeting their regional housing need, of which Santa Rosa is not, and it requires that these residential projects uh, not go through a discretionary review process. So that means there there's no requirement for a use permit or design review, landmark alteration, but instead these are processed in a ministerial fashion, which means they are only measured against objective standards. Because these projects are uh, not subject to discretionary review, they are also not subject to the California Environmental Quality Act. Projects need to meet a number of requirements in order to be processed through SB 35, a uh, streamlined and ministerial process. They include that a project is primarily residential and includes at least two units. Projects over 10 units must include a specified level of affordability. The project sites must be um, considered infill by state definition and they cannot contain a number of environmental issues. And further, uh, construction workers for uh, the project must be paid prevailing wage. In addition, projects must comply with each and every objective design standard within uh, a city and any other standard in the city code or general plan. Assembly Bill 2162 went into effect January of 2019. This bill addresses the need for support, supportive and emergency housing and requires the same streamlined and ministerial approval process. As it does not require discretionary review, it is also exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. 
in order for a project to qualify for streamlined and ministerial processing under Assembly Bill 2162. It must include a spe specified number of units uh, for affordable renters, and those units must be restricted for a period of 55 years. In addition, a number of these units must be designated as supportive housing, and the non-residential floor area needs to be used for on-site supportive services. The standards contained in the text amendment before you are sourced from the city's design guidelines. They have been modified or eliminated based on the need to remain objective or feasible. And um, as such, there have been several iterations of these proposed standards that have gone through staff review, uh, board and commission review, in addition to public comment. The topical areas in the text amendment before you include neighborhood compatibility, building design, massing and architecture, outdoor and common space, site design, and accessory elements. The neighborhood compatibility standards focus on a multifamily development being well integrated into a single family neighborhood. The building design standards relate to materials and details, including that the exterior of affordable units shall be indistinguishable from market rate units. The massing and architecture section emphasizes architectural features, building recesses, and entries. The common and open space section addresses both private and common open space minimums. As a special note, the downtown station area specific plan is not included in these requirements based on uh, design review board and public comment. However, this may be addressed separately uh, throughout the downtown station area specific plan process. The site design standards focus on the location of parking, screening, and safety and ease of site layout. And finally, the accessory elements focus on mechanical screening, fencing, and refuse containers. As many of you know, the city currently has a number of objective standards within the city code. Some that uh, many are very familiar with are the development standards by zoning district. These include setbacks, maximum height, or lot coverage for structures. There's also a section on landscaping, which requires one tree per five parking spaces, and that setbacks be maintained with landscaping. The city code also includes the water efficient landscape ordinance, which requires the use of drought tolerant plants. Uh, outdoor lighting is a section covered in the zoning code which requires downshielded lighting. And there is a section in the zoning code on parking, which dictates the number of parking spaces required by use and also the design and dimension of parking spaces. I will note that both Senate Bill 35 and Assembly Bill 2162 do modify parking requirements based on certain qualifying factors, so in some cases, uh, pursuant to Senate Bill 35, no parking spaces are required based on proximity to public transit. There is also a requirement for streamlined and ministerial projects to be consistent with our hillside development ordinance, which requires uh, more restrictive side yard and front yard setbacks in addition to our Creekside development ordinance. And finally, the city uh, policies include standards for streets, sidewalks, and bike lanes, all of which would still be implemented. In June, an online survey was released to the public with the proposed design standards. The Community Advisory Board, the Planning and Economic Development Department email distribution list, which includes over 15,000 email addresses, including builders, nonprofits, governmental organizations and other interested parties receive notice of this online survey. In addition, a website and survey were posted to the city's various social media accounts and were distributed by way of flyers at two community events. The online survey was created in English and Spanish and a total of, at last check, I believe 146 people responded. 
The survey was set up to ask participants to rank the proposed design standards in order of preference by topical area. There was general consensus in favor of design standards in each area, including limiting the height of new buildings abutting preservation districts, the location of parking and building orientation, and the inclusion of single family design elements. Commenters also favored requiring affordable units to contain the same material and level of detail as the market rate units and requiring common open space areas for projects with more than 10 units. The survey also included an opportunity to add suggestions other than those design standards included in the survey. Participants express the importance of water efficient landscaping and landscaping generally, the need for compatible or earth tone neighborhood colors, high quality materials and additional parking. And the entire results of the survey have been included as attachment five to the staff report. So the text amendment before you has evolved based on public comment um, through the survey and also through the uh, Cultural Heritage Board, Design Review Board, and Planning Commission meetings. Back in June, a um, presentation was given to the Design Review Board and Cultural Heritage Board. Uh, the board members at that time provided their comments with the proposed standards. A majority of the board members did express their concerns regarding a ministerial process for design review, and they understood the difficulty associated with forming these standards. Specific comments that staff members were able to incorporate into the ordinance included um, limiting open space minimums, to areas outside the downtown station area plan to avoid constraining development, especially in this area where the city's focusing on uh, additional development. In addition, a board member suggested that requiring on-site amenities to be located to the rear or center of the site could deactivate the street space and thus the standard was removed. A number of other standards um, were amended based on, on board comment and um, those have been uh, explained further within the staff report. In September of this year, the Planning Commission uh, held a public hearing on the proposed zoning code text amendment and was supportive of the proposed design standards. The proposed amendments are exempt from the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act per CEQA guideline section 15061B3 in that the amendments themselves do not have the potential to cause an effect on the environment. They are um, written to preserve and enhance aesthetic resources and each of the proposed amendments has been written to conform the city's code to state law. And finally, that any conceivable impact of the proposed amendments would be speculative in the absence of a specific development proposal. So with that, the Planning Commission and the Planning and Economic Development Department recommend uh, that the council introduce an ordinance adding city code chapter 2039 related to objective design standards for streamlined and ministerial residential developments. And I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mrs. Nicholson. Councilor, are there any questions? Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I mean, you may have just touched on this slightly. Um, on slide 18, you refer to um, enhancing aesthetic uh, resources. I'm curious as to the um, Planning Commission's response to this and how it applies to our historic districts and the preservation of those and, and how we are being sensitive to those districts um, while at the same time um, trying to enhance our um, building of affordable housing and other housing as well. I do not recall the commission making any specific comments on um, our preservation districts. The Cultural Heritage Board um, did express a lot of concerns about um, uh, the inability to review a project like they normally would under a landmark alteration permit. 
The zoning code currently has a requirement um, for building height within preservation districts, which would still be in effect, even though it's not explicitly addressed in this uh, text amendment because it, it currently is in the code. Um, however, there wasn't consensus on a specific item that could be added to these objective standards that would uh, really encompass every possible circumstance within the preservation districts, and, and we really found that to be a challenge. Okay, thank you. And I think in, in my reading of the staff report, um, th these, we will be, as much my assumption and my hope that we will be sensitive to our historic neighborhoods while um, at the same time being um, careful to make sure that we, that we identify those buildings that are important uh, and meaningful um, because not every building in a historic district is, uh, would be considered important. So I, I'm just wanting to make sure that, to, to relieve the, the, the community or those that live in these historic districts and the community at large, that we will be sensitive to those. Thank you. Council Member Combs, do you have any questions? Thank you. Um, and I appreciate the report that's been brought forward and the outreach that uh, that the staff has done. Um, I I do have a, I understand that this is uh, basically coming to us as a state requirement. Um, I have some concern about the ability of neighborhoods to establish a form-based code so that there would be an objective design standard for their neighborhood. This, for example, might impact a historic district. Um, so is it possible in the future for, do we have a mechanism for neighborhoods to bring forth uh, some kind of uh, objective design standards such as a form-based code to protect uh, historic or uh, similar uh, districts? Uh, this is Claire Hartman, Deputy Director for Planning. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this set of standards could evolve over time with the city. It's important to have standards at this point since the state law will prevail whether we have these standards in place or not. So this is a good, a good first step for the city um, and it has been vetted broadly. Uh, and there are very few projects, in fact the city has not uh, processed a project that met the criteria yet, so it's still early in this process, but this, this kind of is a great first step for the city. It sets a broad standard that went through Cultural Heritage Board and broad public review to get us to this point. But yeah, I think cer certainly the standards could change over time as we get to know how this is gonna work out. Is the intent of um planning such as the station area plan or the new downtown plans to include some specific design standards as we move those projects forward? Yes, on uh, December 3rd, there'll be a joint study session with the City Council and Planning Commission and you'll um, what you'll see is uh, our uh, the city's draft preferred alternative and uh, as part of that, package, um, and this is out for public review this month, uh, you'll see that there are design considerations, at least thematically, that we'll need to work through um, on the edges of our preservation districts. Thank you very much. I, I really, again, appreciate that you brought this forward to us so that while the state is uh, sort of forcing our hand, we have something to work with while we develop um, perhaps more detailed design guidelines. Thank you. All right, any other questions from council? Council Member Fleming. First, a hearty thank you to all the work that you did, especially the community outreach and working with our boards and commissions that we rely so heavily on for their input. I do have a number of questions. Um, on slide seven, um, we have a requirement for affordability based um, for 55 years, which is excellent. I'm wondering if, um, you mentioned that there would be a threshold number of units in order to trigger the affordability requirement. Do you know that number? Are we still working on that? 
Senate Bill 35 has a threshold, um, 10 or more units, um, and then 10% of those units need to be affordable. I don't know the number under Assembly Bill 2162 off the top of my head, but I have it here and can likely find it. Okay, no, not a big deal, it's just a curiosity. It's always um, important to kind of highlight the work that we do when we're uh, making units and making them easier to get built, which is the point of this, um, and do it on, on our terms. Um, will the affordable units that are triggered under either bill be um, fully integrated? As in, I understand that the community feedback and I was able to watch the meetings online will not be distinguishable in um, nature from from the uh, market rate units, but will they also not be all clustered together? The objective design standard just addresses the exterior appearance of the affordable units and that they would have the same level of detail and materials. It does not address anything uh, relative to site planning. Mm -hmm. um, I, I might defer to Claire to anything that may have been included in the inclusionary housing ordinance. We'll have to look into that, I don't have the answer. Yep, I don't recall that we said anything about clustering or siloing affordable units, so it's something that I'd like to see come back if at all possible, so that the units can be truly integrated and not have a developer who intends to do you know, a great job run out of money and then we have you know, a problem getting those last five units built that were intended to be affordable. Um, and then on slide 12, I was pleased to see the public commons. I'm a big fan of public commons and protecting and growing our public commons. Um, that for uh, developments of 22 or more units, uh, there would be three, um, there would be two open spaces, one for adults and one for children. And for uh, developments of 100 or more, that we would have three. I'm wondering, um, what kinds of guidelines there are for these public spaces? Like for adults, are we talking about a common room or a gymnasium? Like when you get above more than two units, is there some flexibility in that? I just wanna make sure I'm understanding your question correctly. So is there, is the question, is there specific criteria for what defines an adult open space area? Well, so I'm asking, like, is it prescriptive? So if I come in and I build 22 units, am I told that for an adult situation, I need to have, like, a common room, and for children, I need to have a play structure? Or am I informed that, you know, these are the types of things that would meet the needs of children in a common open space, and these are the types of things that would meet for an adult so that perhaps we could get creativity and we can get um, some new ideas and best practices evolving as the market, you know, iterates on things that are working or not? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, the only really specific standard mentioned in the uh, um, open space criteria is that adult open space area doesn't contain play equipment and that there's seating available um, and that a teenage outdoor area might include sports fields, age appropriate park equipment or other recreational equipment. So that one's written more broadly. I think if we, the challenge with this is to, to ensure that it can be measured and we were not supposed to be using any personal judgment. So if you were to look up a child player or a child um, common space and the types of things that would come up, play equipment um, or just general uh, kind of landscaped area, then, then that would apply. But again, it, we have to avoid the use of personal judgment. Yeah, it seems to me though, I know we're trying to take personal judgment out of it, that uh, it would be one of those things where when you see it, you know it, right? That, right. Uh, you know, that there could be seating in a children's space for like an adult like myself who's kind of wants to sit down while their child is playing. But it is interesting. And then the last question around that one is that when you do get over the number that would have require three, which is three open um, public spaces. Does it, do we have any prescription around whether that third unit um, of public space goes to a child space or an adult space? Like if you have an under 12 space and an adult space, does that next one go to teenagers? Or can you build a gym? Or like, what, what are we talking about here? Yes, so um, if there are more than 100 units, then there would be one space 
for adults, one for teenagers, and one for younger children. And of course, okay. people could attend different areas, but the equipment there would be more geared toward those specified age groups. Okay, so it does go on to be meet the needs of the community more specifically, the greater the number of units. That's excellent yes. to hear. Um, and then I'm wondering, is um, parking for bikes a requirement? Yes, parking for bikes is a requirement in our zoning code. It's under the parking section and nothing uh, that I've seen in the state legislation takes away any uh, of the city's ability to enforce their existing bicycle parking requirements. It's just for automobiles. Excellent. And then I'm wondering um, how low can we go on parking? You said that some parking requirements might be waived um, in regarding proximity to public transportation. I'm wondering beyond that um, in areas that are, you know, maybe not typically seen as that but are fairly close to workspaces. Um, is there any way to lower our um, existing parking requirements or would somebody have to come and ask for um, a reduction? Typically to um, provide fewer parking spaces than what's required in the zoning code, you would have to go through a discretionary process like a minor use permit. And so that would take the project out of this streamlined process. Mm -hmm. There are um, more criteria than just proximity to public transit that reduce the number of parking spaces or eliminate them in Senate Bill 35. I can pull up what, what those other criteria are, That's but. Not necessary. What I'm getting at here is that because we're trying to do something that moves us more towards a by right type of situation or a ministerial, as you, as you call it here, um, that we can uh, move toward our goals that I believe are both within the spirit of the law and this, the intention of the council at this point to not get us hung up on building parking spaces that we, none, of, none of us want. Um, so, okay, and then... Um, as long as it's a standard and it's objective and clear and you and the council's willing to apply it 100% of the time, that's what, that's what is going to be in this ordinance. Okay, and last question I have here is, um, what is the, um, and you know, it's okay if the, the, you just give me a couple examples. Um, what were the nature of the DRB and the Cultural Heritage Board Concerns. I mean, you touched on it a little bit, but I'm wondering if um, if you can elucidate a bit for us. Sure, I can do that. So the, the again, the general sentiment was concern about how to really get good design into objective standards. Uh, because they are used to working with our guidelines which allow for flexibility and, and discretion. Um, specific comments, well a more specific comment was a concern that any of these objective standards uh, might make a project infeasible and so it was really a challenge thinking through um, what any standard could do to a a project on a certain site or a project with a certain number of units or a certain architectural style. Uh, more specific comments related to, um, well, one specific comment that I didn't address in my presentation was to eliminate a requirement for, uh, which would prohibit the use of a vinyl window type that came from our design guidelines, but a design review board member mentioned that that's a common window type selected for more affordable multifamily projects, and so he felt that that should be eliminated um, to to get the units that, that we're seeking at this time. Okay, thank you. And last thing, which is, I guess, a question comment, which is, is there anything that would trigger, um, this seems to me like it should be a living document. Is it a living document, and what would trigger a review that would not be cumbersome to our development community, but would also allow for the community to have a say if something kind of goes sideways? Well, I can answer that. Um, so what we intend to do is, you know, as we report out for implementation of this policy, um, like I said, we, we haven't had any, even though this is in effect, whether we have these standards adopted or not, um, it's a buy right if they meet these qualifications. So what we intend to do is report out um, to our various boards and to the council as we get an application as uh, as we learn how this is implemented. Uh, and I wanted to uh, follow up on Amy's comments. Another balancing act that the boards had to do is that this by right um, and by having 
application of these standards 100% of the time, you, one of the concerns is that they, these projects will start to look identical or it's almost designs itself. So they didn't take every design guideline and make it a standard. Um, and they did that deliberately so that there is some flexibility in, in how these um, build out over time. So I think we need to have some more experience about uh, they saw this as a good first step, but get more experience in how this is applying and uh, if this is giving enough flexibility and design for outcome. I really appreciate the thoughtfulness and I encourage you to come back and have this be iterative where possible. Thank you. All right, thank you. I've got a couple of cards on this. Dwayne DeWitt followed by Ann Seeley. And I do not see Dwayne, so we'll do Ann Seeley followed and, and by- Excuse me. Oh, oh, and I apologize, it is Thank a public you. hearing, so we will open it. Ann Seeley followed by Gregory Fearon. Vice Mayor Rogers and Council, Ann Seeley speaking for Concerned Citizens for Santa Rosa. As a longtime housing advocate, you'd think I'd be jumping for joy at the vigor of this legislation. However, there is not a single mention in the legislation or in the staff report describing it of public noticing or input. That is wrong. You are challenged to make sure that politics, political forces from the state of California don't overwhelm your responsibility to your constituents, to keep them informed and give them a say in their city. In the past, I've seen you be wonderfully creative in solving problems and making sure public policy serves the public. And I think you can do that here. It would be really important to have, as one of your guidelines, public noticing of the facts of development. If people don't know that a building is, is going to arrive until it's already done, they don't have any chance at all to influence matters that may be of concern to them. I know that you can find a way to do this, to add something to involve public noticing. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. We have Gregory Fearon, followed by Thomas Ells. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor and members of the council. I'm in a real quandary because I'm on both sides of this issue. Clearly, this is going to benefit low-income housing, uh, shelters. You haven't even addressed what I talked about two weeks ago, which is the budget bill for this year uh, goes beyond those two little things. And there's a whole lot of other interest at the legislature to start saying this needs to happen all over the state, so we're going to make it by right. Uh, you know. I'm, I'm helping try to put supportive housing together at a variety of income levels uh, from 100% down to zero, and virtually all of them are gonna go through this process. Uh, they're all containing the elements that this has. They're gonna have to jump through lots of hoops, but they're gonna be at an advantage over that market rate out there that isn't gonna be giving any kind of affordability and wants to develop them and thinks that they ought to be given the same kind of streamlined, you know, buy right process. So I'm happy that this is saying to the low income development community, uh, we need you to build housing and we're gonna tell the city that they have to do it by right. Now, I am also on the other side because I really want neighborhoods to be in control of their uh, neighborhoods. I want the city to have vibrant, citizens involved and a long ago when you guys were saying you're going to build right after the fires and you had a little pie chart up there that had a little civic engagement i warned you that you lose some civic engagement by trying to get housing built so here i am saying don't go so fast to make it so there's no citizen engagement but please help us build supportive housing and low-income housing in particular and i'm happy that the legislature has held a gun to your head on that issue 
and I'm really happy the staff has done the best job possible of trying to figure this out. Uh, they are not going to have an easy time in the next year trying to figure out the minds of the legislature over what things ought to go through this process. But they've had a really good start at trying to come up with some objective standards that you can chew on. Uh, and we can all try to figure out if we can avoid that kind of, um, you know, standardization of every house in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Thomas Ells. So thank you, uh, I agree with those comments that have just been made. Uh, in addition, I mean, you know, we have to think about, I believe it's Greta Thurman who says, uh, Thurman, who is saying we really have to think about the future and how we're addressing climate change itself. This doesn't really address climate change, it's talking about housing. And part of the things that we attempted to do in, in uh, bringing SMART here through the Transportation Land Use Committee was organizing transportation and land use in terms of the housing in the downtown. And, the, and you know, so the downtown area specific plans relative to the stationary specific plans are doing that. But here you have the most important comment that was made by the public which had to do with open space and green areas, and you've exempted the downtown, which was held to be 60% open space and green garden areas uh, in the other areas. And I would say, here you've thrown the baby out with the bath. This is the most important thing, and what it doesn't do is address climate change, which you can do without exempting the downtown by using rooftop gardens. And I've mentioned it before, but sometimes it just slips by. Not only are there rooftop gardens, you can have vertical gardening along the spaces, along the sides of the buildings. And these are very innovative and they're very uh, amenable. People really appreciate it. Changes the climate of the downtown, changes the, and not just the visible climate, but the temperatures and, and uh, the oxygen, all of these things that are incredibly important. Um, so I would encourage you, you know, uh, two spaces or three spaces, they can all be incorporated in a rooftop garden. You want to, with this, encourage people to build housing in the downtown. But again, I've said, why would someone live there if all they're going to do is look down on, on the asphalt, whether it's asphalt streets or asphalt roofs, it's, it's not, uh, uh, it's not convenient or uh, it's not something that people want to do as they live there. But if you have rooftop gardens, it would change everything. And here's the opportunity to include that. Please, I would encourage you, or at least exclude the exemption of the downtown from the open space requirement until you can review that and include that review of the, of the rooftop gardens in in this as you as you modify your your ordinance thank you thank you thomas and duane you were out of the room when we called you the first time if you want to go ahead we're in a, a public hearing so anybody can talk at this point duane if you want to make your comments now's your time Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from the Sonoma County Housing Advocacy Group. And I'm typically supportive of anything that gets us more affordable housing. In this document today, it points out that SB 35 specifically requires a specified level of affordability and also that it should be in fill. But the caveat, without specific or specified environmental issues, and you mentioned that it wouldn't affect what's called the California Environmental Quality Act. But in the area where I'm from, of Roseland, we have an endangered species. Some people curse it, other people think it helps Roseland. It's called the California tiger salamander. Federal regulations override state regulations. One of the things that happened recently was called the Roseland Specific Plan. And during that plan, the city essentially tried to do a bit of a bait and switch. 
and say that, okay, we're gonna call this a priority development area to try to get the housing in, which supposedly should be near the downtown and the transportation corridors, but they extended it all the way out to Bellevue Avenue, miles and miles from downtown here. So specifically, you have a housing authority which has been in existence for over 60 years. You've been pumping millions upon millions and millions of dollars into what you call affordable housing. Frequently, it costs far more than what could be built by the private sector. You have some home builders here tonight. You have the North Bay Builders Exchange here tonight. Perhaps they'll enlighten us on how we can make truly affordable housing occur to meet the regional housing needs assessments that you folks haven't been able to do during the 60 years you've had a housing authority and now it's now why you were under this new legislation. So let's put the package all together and let's see how can we actually build the affordable housing in the downtown area near the transportation that we also are paying millions and millions of dollars for and actually make all this stuff work. Now, the thing I'm most concerned about is that you here at the local level will try to fudge that term infill and make it go all the way out to the city's limits, six miles away from down here. So what we need to have is your political will and say, yeah, we got a downtown specific plan that we're also financing and we want the housing down here, really. Not just far out on Bellevue Avenue where you've sunk millions upon millions of dollars into a project that hasn't even broken ground and might not succeed. At Dutton, Bellevue, thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? I'm gonna close the public hearing. I'm gonna bring it back to the council. Uh, council Member Sawyer, do you wanna put a motion on the table? Sure, Vice Mayor, I will do that. To introduce an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code, adding Chapter 20 through 39, Objective Design Standards for Streamlined and Ministerial uh, Residential Developments to create Objective Design Standards for Streamlined and Ministerial Residential Developments, file number REZ19-019, and wait for the reading. Second. All right, Council, are there any comments? Council Member Combs, are you still with us? I think I heard her drop off. Okay, Council, your votes. Oh, and that's right, it's a voice vote. Nope. Vice Mayor Rogers? Aye. Council Member Combs? I will be marking her as absent. Victoria, uh, Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Oliveras? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. All right, that item will pass with four ayes and three council members absent. Mr. City Manager, item 14.2. Item 14.2, public hearing, adoption of mitigated negative declaration for Kiwanis Springs Community Park Master Plan and adoption of the Kiwanis Springs Community Park Master Plan. Jin Santos, Deputy Director of Parks, presenting. I'm having trouble hearing. Did did we get disconnected? Sorry, Council Member Combs. We're about to start item 14.2. Okay, so I missed the vote on that item. Correct. Okay, it thank has, you. I'm sorry. It has I got four eyes with three ab uh, abstentions. Okay, thank you. I'd have voted for the item, but I had a question. Uh, I can make it can wait. All right, Director, item 14.2. 
Good evening, Vice Mayor Rogers, Council Members, Jen Santos, Deputy Director for Parks. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about uh, the adoption of the Master Plan for Gowanus Springs Park, as well as the associated environmental documents, the mitigated negative declaration. So just as a reminder of where we're looking at, the um, yellow item in the screen is the park right in the middle there. And we have Highway 101 in red and Highway 12 up here at the north part of the town. And so this park is located in the southeast quadrant of the city. And taking a little closer look at Kiwanis Springs Park, the outlined yellow area is the park proper. It's 19.2 uh, acres, approximately. And just to give you some orientation, this is Taylor Mountain Regional Park right here, where the highlighter is. Um, and the park is split between uh, two pieces, <laughs> between Mita Avenue right here. And we have Kiwanis Springs Road on the north, as well as Kiwanis Terrace that runs up to uh, an entrance to Taylor Mountain Road and all the way down to uh, Mita. That's kind of tricky to do with a pointer, but essentially this is Kiwana Terrace on the south southern side of the park. Um, this land was dedicated in phases to the city in 2008 and two, or 2006 through 2008. We have, um, it's very difficult to see in this particular slide, but there are existing mitigation ponds here and here and here, three of them. There's also some retention ponds on the site, on this side of the park, and it is bisected by Kiwana Springs Creek. So this is the blue line that runs all the way down through the park. That's Kiwana Springs Creek. Um, we have, um, although the park is 20 acres, the usable area of it is right here in the main part of the park, as well as over here, there's a little portion of it that's usable over here for active uses. The active use area is about five to six acres, even though there is a six acre park. So that's important to know as you're looking at the amenities that we ended up with. Um, we do have a wonderful dedicated group of volunteers that help us out here with this park. Uh, they help maintain um, a rural trail. They also clean the creek every year, um, two to three times a year, as in addition to all the things that our water department's creek stewardship staff do, as well as our park maintenance staff as well. So they're um, a really great and engaged group of uh, neighbors in this area. So just a reminder about the acreage and the drainage areas that are on the northern part of the park. Um, the items we took into consideration as we move forward to start our discussions with the community included the uh, Citywide Creek Master Plan, as well as the Bicycle and Pedestrian Plan. Uh, of course, our uh, 2008 Business and Strategic Plan and um, the General Plan, which designates this park as a community park uh, for the area. And it is the only community park in this entire area. The next closest community park would be Galvin. And if you think about it in terms of geography, the Taylor Mountain and that mountain range do separate it. So it's not physic, there's no physical community park in this area except this one. And so as we started our conversation, we started in 2015 in May, having conversations with the community at two community workshops. Um, we ultimately ended up with seven community workshops, which included three Board of Community Services. Uh, uh, public meetings as well. Uh, in between those uh, community workshops in 2017, we also collected online input as well. And then at each meeting, this is kind of an overview, but we did a lot of outreach at each meeting to make sure we could get as much community feedback as possible. Uh, we, of course, mailed over 6,000 mailers out to the residents, e-blasts and media, Facebook features, our newsletter, of course, um, news flashes on santarosarec.com, and our event page uh, posted on nextdoor.com to all Santa Rosa Nextdoor users. Uh, we also had our calendar listings of upcoming meetings, and of course we have notification on site at each park site. And it looks like we ended up with two of the same slides in there, so I'm gonna <laughs> move on through. And so just to give you an idea of what type of um, engagement we began with the community, um, the first time we met with the community members, we gave them a map that you see on the left side of the screen here, which shows the, it highlights the park in, kind of a pink color there in the middle. Uh, 
and then around it provides the community with what other parks are in the area and what sort of amenities are within those parks. And of course we did our traditional dot exercises and we took also comment cards so that people could write out uh, really detailed information about uh, their amenities they preferred in the park. So this is um, very similar to what we did in the first three meetings. And to um, give you a sense of what the community, this is after our first um, meeting, it's our second community meeting, so we first gathered some information about what type of amenities the uh, community would like, and we put together a draft in June. And so I'm gonna start off to the east side of the park over here. We had an optional parking restroom and dog park over here, uh, an area. We identified existing parallel parking along Kiwana Springs Road. We identified potential for picnic areas right here around a really big oak tree that is there, it's beautiful. Um, we identified this yellow feature here, which was a trail, our path. And we also didn't physically identify it, but we identified it by label, the drainage areas that were in this area. Um, we identified this dot dashed line here as a potential trail, as well as a pedestrian uh, over, overlook a bridge over there that will connect you from one side to the other. There is right now, uh, people cut through the creek and it's eroding the creek bank right there. So there is uh, a desire from the community to, as well as the city to have a pedestrian access there. Um, the absolute number one and continues to be the number one requested item for this community was the dog park and it's located in this area. Uh, of course our shade shelters and shade pavilions. So that would be a shade shelter with picnicking underneath and um, traditional playground. So we're talking about a very large playground, what you'd see at Finley here, uh, similar to our other, you know, Finley Community Center. Uh, a restroom, bocce courts, and a parking area so that we can get folks here. Uh, we do anticipate, because this is a community park, that folks would be driving to the park, they would be staying longer than 45 minutes to enjoy an activity here. So it's not a quick stop, it's a more of an extended stay. And of course, a large turf area, and I say large with caution, it's not large enough to have any sports fields. It's relatively small, a little bit bigger than the turf area at Bear Park, if you've been to Bear Park. It's not very large. So from there, uh, we went to the Board of Community Services and a public meeting pro and uh, solicited more feedback to kind of get some more details from the community as well as the Board of Community Services. And um, what we had changed on here is we've uh, heard from the neighborhood that they would like sand, you know, potentially sand volleyball courts. So we added those in there. We also changed the, um, I think we changed the way the bocce courts were laid out, but otherwise they were in the same general area. And let's see, I wanna make sure I got everything here. We also added another shade pavilion. The community said they would like to have picnicking and shade near the creek so that they could overlook, because it is a really beautiful area to walk by there, so they wanted that. And then we um, also added the community garden here. This was a request. Uh, there was existing community garden at um, a local school um, next to a future neighborhood park. And those that community garden group had to vacate that space and they um, identified this as a potential uh, garden area. And so we added that in there. Um, we also added a little bit more uh, picnicking, smaller picnic sites in here as well along the trail. And those are the major changes since we first started to this, this plan. So then what we also did here on this, uh, in August we went back to the Board of Community Services again to solicit both feedback from the Board of Community Services as well as the community. We identified the existing uh, water department's uh, water pump station that was on site just so we could be clear that that was there, it was not available to use for an amenity. Um, we also, let's see, we changed the shape to be more in what we thought we might end up with here on a community garden uh, because of the creek setback. So we made a, an estimate of what that might look like there. We um, also uh, added table tennis 
it's very hard to see. This is, again, a 20-acre site. It's really difficult to see it, but it is there. Uh, one, of the, one of the groups that I also engaged with and forgot to mention was the Sonoma Academy. They are just at the end of Kiwanis Springs Road, would be to the right of your screen. And I met with them at least once a year. And uh, the students did dioramas, and they talked about what sort of things they would like to see in a park. What would bring them to the park are things like this, like table tennis and uh, zip lines, and some of them mentioned ponds. And it was uh, really exciting to work with this group. But this is something that came out of that process there. And then we, um, we relocated the restroom just a little bit. But those are the major changes there. So in um, 2016, Council approved a, uh, an agreement with GSM Landscape Architecture, and we brought the professionals in to um, take it from there and get more into the details of what this community would like and to really get in there with things to scale and understand what we could actually do and what we could actually fit in there. Council also hired David J. Powers and Associates uh, as an environmental consultant to help us uh, start the process to look at um, what we had done previously with the community, was it going to be any major impacts as we knew it as we started to work through this process? Um, I'm going to turn it over to um, Elizabeth from GSM and Associates. They're going to take you through these um, design processes. And um, just so you know a little bit of background, David J. Powers was doing some initial work behind this plan, that um, the previous plan they had seen uh, to start getting into the idea of what uh, sort of impacts there would be. At the end of the uh, master planning process is when David J. Powers was uh, finally able to say, okay, let's take a really hard look at what the impacts are now that we know what the master plan was. So I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth. Hello, everyone. As Jen was saying, we were brought on this project at the end of 2016. And we, the first thing we did is we brought our survey crew out to actually survey the site so we could determine where the top of bank was located. We want to make sure we stay away from the, the creek bed. We located the heritage trees, the large trees, actually any trees over six inch caliper are located on the plan. And then we, of course, with the topographic survey, had the contours mapped out on the site so we could determine how the ups and downs of the paths will need to go. So this information allowed us to take the program elements that Jen spoke about and draft them up to scale and place them on the plan. And I will start again also, like Jen did, on the west side of the site with the community garden. One of the changes we made to the community garden is we made the parking areas just a little bit smaller and allowed greater plots, garden plots, that could be used because that was one of the, the mentions at the beginning of this process. Then we, we were able to accurately lay out the pathway along the north side of that creek with the topographic survey that we had. So that, thank you, Jen, that followed around. We, we noted where it would be good to have a crosswalk there across Mita Avenue. We've talked to the Department of um, Traffic ab about looking into possibly turning that into a future crosswalk. Then we brought the paths down and we were able to stay outside of the top of the creek bank and also avoid having the path run through those existing stormwater management locations. The parallel parking that is on Kiwana Springs Road, we were able to put a pathways. You can see two gray pathways there. There's one right here that comes down and connects to the path and then the par parallel parking, there's one that comes down and connects to the path there. So as you walk along the, the path over here, you come down to the west side where the bridge is. And again, the topographic survey helped inform us of how long that bridge needs to be to avoid the creek, the top of Creek Bank. That bridge will need to be about 50 feet long. It comes in one structure and they bring it out and being able to span top of bank to top of bank will lessen any sort of environmental impact that might be caused. The Kiwana Terrace right along here, there is concern about the parking along this area is also eroding the top of the creek bank because that is a very narrow area and cars are heavy and 
rain moves things and slopes go down. So we are proposing to put some parking deterrents in there in the ways of large boulders. I think city has several areas that they have incorporated large boulders, so four foot by four foot by by four foot tall and spaced no more than six feet apart will help deter the parking along there and help preserve the creek bank. So that brings us down to the main activity of the park where Jen had mentioned it's about five acres of active area and we took the program from the 2015 plans and developed the, the dog park which is the dark brown right here. And this is the children's play area where, we, the, where it was located before and the parking lot right here. There are two bocce ball courts right above here, a shade structure. There are additional shade structures for picnic areas along here. The table tennis is right in here and the volleyball court is moved over here. One of the things we did do from the 2015 plan is we pulled the turf the multi-use turf area out of the location of the activities. It's easier to maintain the turf that way. The picnic area across the turf stayed in place around that big oak tree. We did not put an additional area here because we felt like it would be too close to the creek bed after that survey was done and we were able to locate that creek bed. We also on this plan located some proposed trees of where we thought those they would be good locations for that. We took this plan to the community at the end of May for a meeting and we got feedback during that meeting and as Jen mentioned, we also got feedback through the city website and the Facebook page for social media. So we gathered all that information up and then we developed um, the next plan which we have in June. And I think to move this over, thank you. There we go, okay, thank you. So this is the June plan and I'll start again for the community garden side. They wanted even less parking than what we showed previously because they wanted more garden space. They want lots of garden space. So we were able to accommodate that. We reduced that, those parking areas down to just under six spaces, including a van um, parking space for ADA. The pathway along the north pretty much stayed where it was, uh, avoiding the top of Creek Bank and the storm water management areas. The bridge there on the, oh, where'd that go? On the east side of the site stayed there and the parking deterrent stayed. So most of the comments, as you can imagine, were in the active use area over here. One of the, the most comments we got was were to separate the play area from the dog park, get it closer to the turf area and take it away from the traffic because it was on the previous plan, it was right there along Kiwana Terrace. So we were able to move the play area away from there over to this corner right here. It then could expand and get larger. And we have two sections to the play area. We have um, two to five year old equipments for two to five year olds and then we have equipments for five to 12 year olds. We also move the table tennis over to this area and because we like the relationship previously of the shade structures with the play equipment, we move those also. And if you, as you look closer at this plan, you can see there's kind of a nice circular arc that goes through here and the, the shade structures follow that arc and they follow the, the play area. There is an existing restroom, or not an existing, there's a proposed built restroom, pre-manufactured restroom, there's a little blue square on there and that pretty much remained in the same location as where it was previously. It's conveniently located to the parking and also it's fairly close to the children's play area which sometimes is important to get there quickly. The Some of the write-in comments after the meeting was that the community would like to see a pump track similar to what is at Northwest Park the, with the bicycles. So it actually fit quite nicely, about the same size in where the previous play equipment was. So now there's a pump track located in there. And this is a good multi-generational draw to this community park. The 
volleyball area, because it's sand volleyball, we went ahead and moved it back into the multi-turf area. There was still um, request to reduce the amount of lawn because of the amount of water that lawns take. And also we created that, that curvilinear shape of the lawn, which helps reduce people feeling like they can come out and play a full-scale football or soccer game on the turf. The, there's also a large pavilion located in the center of the paved area, which will accommodate larger groups of 20 to 25 people to come and have a group activity in the park. Then we developed a second shade structure over here by the oak tree because we took it out next to the creek. So we added an additional one over here. Another thing to note is that the pathway that comes around the turf area is about a quarter mile. So you'll be able to track your fitness as you walk around there. And then the pathway that goes from the community garden all the way through here, past the stormwater management areas, down along here to the, the bridge, that's about a half a mile. So that's another great way that you can measure your, your fitness levels on that. So again, we took this plan at the end of June back to the community to listen to their feedback, see how they like the changes. And again, it got posted on the websites and we got the social media. Yeah, one thing we did add in this, in this park section was a basketball court. Now, most community parks have basketball courts, full-size basketball courts. They'll have one, two, or three of them. This one, because we wanted the multi-generational activities for everyone, we did create a half-size basketball court that is separated from Mita Avenue. It's about 400 feet into, from the curb of Mita Avenue, and then you have the street and then the houses after that. Um, there's also several trees that will be placed around that court and kind of nestle it in. And we also reduced the bot. There were two bocce ball courts. We reduced them down to one bocce ball court based on the comments from the community. Oh, thank you. Right, so th this plan then was created, the July plan, based on the comments from June. And the major comments from June were, was the noise from the basketball court. So again, we felt like because this is a community park and it's for a larger area of Santa Rosa to come, this is one of the big draws to bring people to the park. And the more people you have coming to the park, typically the less problems you have because people are interested and they're active and involved. So we did keep the basketball, the half court basketball in the site. The other elements that we changed is we had the fitness equipment along the path up here on the no north of the creek, and we ended up bringing it down into this active area, and so the path along the north of the north side of the creek can really focus on the natural aspect of this park. So this plan was taken to the Board of Community Services in August, and we presented it there, and it was approved by unanimous vote. And after that, the plan went over to Will to review with the environmental study. I just wanted to follow up with Elizabeth's comment about the about the plan and let you know that we, um, similar to Northwest Community Park, we had engagement with a community bicycle pump track group who is interested in potentially maintaining this as well as developing it similar to Northwest Community Park, which is a huge help to our, our park there that they do a lot of volunteer work uh, like that as well. Um, and I, I am gonna turn it over to Will. This was a um, very similar to many communities, um, a very, uh, we found some common ground. Not everybody agrees. Uh, there were folks who wanted it, nothing there. That's always the case. There's always uh, folks that want nothing there. There's also folks who want it fully developed with sports and lights and things like that. Uh, uh, bicycle velodrome, I heard. All kinds of bicycle racing tracks uh, were envisioned. Uh, but the community really rolled up their sleeves and worked hard and came together with this uh, with this plan that uh, we think we hit some common ground. So I'll turn it over to Will who took, um, who took this plan and they made um, an analysis of the environmental impacts. 
Good evening, I'm Will Burns with David Powers and Associates. As Jen mentioned, uh, we assisted the city with preparation of the initial study and mitigated negative declaration for the master plan. Um, that process really began in earnest um, after approval, or rec the recommendation of master plan approval by the Board of Community Services. Um, the initial study analyzes all the potential environmental impacts that could result from implementation of the uh, master plan. And that included, Go ahead, sorry, bring the excuse me, closer. okay, sorry. Uh, Will Burns with David Powers and Associates. Sure. Um, so we looked at the all the environmental issues in the CEQA checklist. Um, the primary focus for this location um, was on biological resources, cultural resources, um, transportation impacts, and also uh, construction impacts, including air quality and noise. Um, so in terms of transportation impacts, we focused on uh, the the closest major intersection, which would be Petaluma Hill Road and Kiwana Springs Road, and reviewed that the level of service for um, the evening peak hour and also the weekend midday peak hour. Uh, under both conditions, that intersection would continue to operate uh, consistently with the city's level of service policies. Um, the, the other uh, primary Areas of concern for the uh, master plan were biological resources, um, specifically the potential presence of California red-legged frog and um, foothill yellow-legged frog, as well as potential for roosting bats and uh, nesting birds. And those impacts were mitigated um, both through limitations on when construction can occur, um, primarily the dry season and periods when it uh, outside of 24 hours of any uh, substantial rain. And in terms of um, the roosting bats and nesting birds, pre-construction surveys are required um, within trees that might be uh, within the proximity of grading on the site. Um, and there are requirements to either evict bats uh, and or avoid areas where there are active nests. Um, Otherwise, uh, uh, construction period impacts were the primary focus. Um, for noise, there are measures included to locate uh, grading equipment and other heavy noise generating uses away from some sensitive uses, as well as um, including a disturbance coordinator that can be contacted in the event there are noise complaints. And then uh, the project also incorporated standard measures recommended by BACMED to address uh, potential dust. In terms of um, cultural resources, there are some cultural resources identified uh, within the park, and those were designed around um, as part of the master plan. And uh, mitigation also included uh, monitoring by Native Americans and an archeologist. Um, so a notice of intent to adopt the mitigated negative declaration, which included these measures, uh, was posted with the uh, county clerk on April 10th for a 30-day review period. Um, the MND concluded that all the potential impacts of the project would be reduced uh, with the incorporation of mitigation measures and other standard municipal code requirements and city standards. So the initial study and mitigated negative declaration has been prepared uh, in, cons in consultation with local, state, and trustee agencies in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, all um, future actions related to implementation of the master plan are covered. Um, and upon council approval, a notice of determination uh, will be filed with the county clerk and state clearinghouse for a 30-day period. Thank you, Will. Um, I just wanted to touch a little bit on, um, I received some comments about um, uh, trash in the creek uh, recently before we came to council, as well as uh, parking along Quana Terrace, and I just wanna make sure we're, that we're clear. Um, I've been, we work with the water department very closely. Um, we, uh, the water department in turn works with Land Paths, who takes many opportunities to uh, provide creek restoration as well as cleanup days. Uh, 
water department staff do say that they uh, are out there at least four times a year. Our staff are out there quite often. Uh, I also wanted to remind you of the volunteer groups from the community that uh, are at the park on a regular basis. They do a lot of hard work cleaning up the trail system in the park. And um, again, this community has done a really tremendous job to get us to this point. We've been out working with them for at least four years. Over the last four years, while we worked on the master plan and then turned it over to Will's team and did the environmental analysis. Uh, so with that, it's our uh, recommendation from the Transportation and Public Works Department, Parks Division, that Council, by resolution, adopt the mitigation, mitigated negative declaration and master plan for Kiwanis Freaks Community Park to include paved trails, community garden, with portable restroom enclosure, parking, picnic areas, shade pavilions, children's play areas for ages 2 to 5 and 5 to 12, a restroom building, bocce courts, dog park, a bicycle pump track, a half basketball court, table tennis, fitness stations, volleyball, multi-use turf area, a pedestrian bridge, crosswalks, and a loop walking path. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Director. Council, any questions? Councilmember Sawyer. Thank you, Vice Mayor. A curiosity question about storage. I didn't, where do the table tennis where do the tables go at either at night or when it's, you know in the winter? I didn't see a storage area. I assume it's under one of the in the back of one of the. Buildings. The table tennis equipment that we found is sturdy and heavy and it's permanent. So you bring your net and you bring your paddles and you just play ping pong all day long. So you don't have to move the move the tables back and forth. That's, and they're that, really cool looking. That's great. And that kind of leads to the next question, which was, are the, um, this is one of the most comprehensive, um, as far as activities, one of the most comprehensive parts that I've seen suggested in quite some time. And so I'm curious about the maintenance of like the fitness equipment, and you just answered the, the table tennis. Uh, are, are there volunteers um, in the community that have done such a great job in, in coming together and design and helping to design this? Are they going to be maintained and kind of monitored by the by the by our wonderful volunteers or what's the responsibility of the city we are always actively seeking volunteers and if this is your opportunity that would be wonderful um, yeah we we do have uh, similar equipment at Bear Park and other parks throughout the community they are uh, they are designed to take a uh, uh, public environment so they take very little maintenance requirements we're really just at the you know, at Bear, just repairing things that do break from time to time. Uh, they're holding up really well at Bear Park, for instance. And we we are, one of the things I did, I'm just gonna tag onto this, I forgot to mention too about our funding. We are looking at a plan. Um, there's about $900,000 available to develop this park. The park is estimated to cost about $19 million to develop. So we will be looking at developing portions of it, but at this point we don't have um, the funding to develop the entire park, but when we do, we will look for um, well-built equipment that stands the test of time. Great, thank you. And, and if I may just add to that, um, although um, we will very much enjoy the um, benefit that may be brought by volunteers, ultimately it will be the city's responsibility to maintain the park as it is for any of our parks. Thank you. Council Member Tibbetts. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, one question I had, Jen, was relating to the pump track. So I know in Northwest we have a really fun pump track and it's maintained by a really dedicated, not just a group of volunteers, but I think they're kind of a bona fide nonprofit, which gives it, I think, a little bit higher level of responsibility and accountability. Are we, when, and also, when, as you know, when it comes to a pump track, it's dealing with something that's really maintenance intensive uh, and safety issues. So is the group that we're working with in, in Kiwana Springs the same group as Northwest? It's actually a different group, um, so it's a more of a, 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 a group that looks throughout California for these opportunities, but we would look for a local organization. It is not something that the city could necessarily maintain by itself. We do, we do this in partnership at Northwest Community Park with the group there, and that's what we would look for here as well. 
So the, who, who is the group in California that you're working with? You know, I don't have their name, but I can get you their, the name that I was working with. We do have uh, local, the same local interest from this group as well. Uh, it's just the, um, the California group called me first. So okay. uh, we, we would look locally to have it, um, have the local group be interested and help us develop that and maintain it in the future. And what recourse do you withhold in the event that volunteers walk away from it? It, you know, it'd be similar in Northwest Community Park. It, you know, like uh, the city attorney said, it, it falls back to the city for maintenance. Uh, so it might be a little different and maybe not as much maintenance, uh, to be honest, but it would still be maintained. Okay, thanks, Jen. Mm -hmm. Council Member Fleming. Yes, thank you, Vice Mayor. I'm curious to know, um, I'm glad that the um, part of the MND uh, mitigations were public transportation. I'm wondering if you know what the headways were and what number of bus, or is that uh, something that could change between now and the way future? I want people to be able to get there on the bus, the Santa Rosa City bus, if they can. Um, I'm not certain of what the actual headways are, but the closest bus stop is uh, at Petaluma Hill Road and Kiwanis Springs Road, and it's within a quarter to a half mile of the of the park boundary. Can you speak, say that into the Excuse microphone? Excuse me, sorry. No worries. <laughs> uh, the, the closest bus stop is at Petaluma Hill Road and Kiwanis Springs Road. I'm not uh, certain of what the headways are, um, but it, that bus stop is located within an, a quarter to a half mile of this park location, so it does provide uh, decent access for people to walk to the park. And, and how many table tennis tables will we be getting for those of us who will be out there all day? Because I imagine I'll be retired by the time this thing gets built and be, be advocating for pickleball in addition to my table tennis habit. Right now there are two located on, in the master plan, but as we go through the process further, if there's a lot of participation and interest in it, there's always room for more. Because okay, I don't want there to be conflicts over, you know, right. people playing all yes. day long. All right, thank you. Great job, guys. Councilmember Combs, any questions? Thank you, Mike. My, my questions were actually already asked, and I just want to thank staff for uh, what appears to be a very uh, effective and intense process uh, to get us to uh, so through so many design stages to this final design. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and open our public hearing. We'll start with Dwayne Dewitt followed by Arlie Haig. And I did not actively seek to involve myself in this community of Kiwana Springs business frequently was mentioned tonight that this community, and that's a specific thing. So I'm not here to perhaps try to influence this plan. I'm here to thank Mr. Sawyer for asking, what is the responsibility of the city? This is a big $19 million project, and yet it has a portable toilet. Bear Farm has been mentioned tonight here a couple times, and that's in my community, and I was on the steering committee for that park. We were told they were building a permanent restroom there. They did. It's locked. After two years of its dedication, people are still using porta potties. That's a public health hazard. Porta potties shouldn't even be in there for the American Disabilities Act for a long term situation. So I'm hoping that tonight you'll get the answers as to whether or not you're going to have the use of porta potties in a large community park in which you're trying to get lots of people to come to for a long time. That is a serious issue. Another issue that's very serious is that on slide nine, she talks about, I should say, Ms. Santos talked about, first eight was the traditional dot exercises and then Slide nine points out, okay, in 2015, we came up with this. And dot exercises can be manipulated. One person can put all their dots on one thing, and then you don't have a balance. 
and it doesn't really accurately reflect how a community might want something to be. So I think what's really important tonight is for what 2015 to 2019 came up with, they're saying that this community decided upon it. Okay, that's great. What we'll need is to make sure that you have that commitment of those volunteers, because a lot of times they're gonna fade away and you're gonna be on the hook, or I should rephrase that. The taxpayers are gonna be on the hook for the cost of this and you've not even been able to provide for Southwest Community Park, which you've had for over 20 years, and place to play for over 20 years. And you haven't been able to provide for those things. So here you're getting ready to make another big financial commitment and you don't have the money. So please answer Mr. Sawyer's question. What is the responsibility of the city when you don't have enough dough to do what you wanna do on the go? Thank you, Duane. Arlie followed by Carla Hebert. Yes, hello, Arlie Haig. If, if any of you heard that rooster crow, I'm sorry. I know that roosters aren't allowed in Santa Rosa City. It was my phone. Good evening, um, city council, local and worldwide. I am a community garden manager and I really love this park in addition to the fact that it has a community garden. And I can't tell you the value of what is being done here because <clears throat> this area, Southeast Santa Rosa, is really a nice area. It's low income, a lot of it, but there are some higher income houses. I think this park will attract almost everyone from these neighborhoods. And I don't think there's gonna be a problem with getting there. Um, right now, a lot of people go up to the Taylor Mountain um, Regional. This is close, so it's a really good draw. And I'm so happy that it's being proposed and I hope it gets passed and approved. I just wanna say that I've been involved with the meetings and the um, different amenities. And I know a lot of people that will go to each one of these because I've been in that neighborhood for since 88 and been waiting for this park for about five or six years. I had the Kiwana Community Garden over at the Kiwana School. Um, we had that for about 10 years. And then the school wanted to um, have a preschool complex, so we had to move. A lot of the people from that garden went over to the South Park Community Garden that I, I also manage. Um, and they're waiting for this to come back so they can be, and, and one of our major gardeners lives right across the street from it, so I'm so happy about that. Um, and I just wanna thank Jen Santos for sticking to this. My name's spelled wrong, guys. <laughs> I notice up there it's spelled wrong. Um, so anyway, please approve this and I think that it will really benefit climate change, for one. <laughs> um, anything to do with preserving the health of the soil is important. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Arlie. Carla, followed by Kendra Holmes. Carla? Okay, Kendra Holmes, followed by Mary Ann Wakefield. Hello, my name is Kendra Holmes. I'm an original owner in the Kiwana Springs development. My house is actually on Mita, which is the west um, wall of the park. And right now, if you follow Kiwana Springs Terrace all the way to Mount Taylor, you can see the RVs, the homeless RVs that um, people were talking about earlier. You can see drug deals and you can see prostitution. It's a major issue over there and I call on a regular basis and the police don't even come. So my concern is that they're gonna build this park and these issues are going to be a part of the park. 
and no one's gonna come and do anything about it. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra. Mary Ann, followed by Linda Sheehan. Hi, I, uh, you know, I live right on the uh, corner of Mita and Kiwana Springs, and I've been there for about 10 years. I retired in this area, moved to Sonoma County and thought it was a great place to be, and my concern is this park. I've been to these to the meetings that I could attend. The very first one, where all the dots were processed, to me was confusing. We had a group of people there attending that meeting and they thought that they had free reign to what this park should be incorporating. There are a lot of things on this agenda or this planning that shouldn't be there. There's no need for a bunch of, or two places for uh, picnic benches as an example. I don't, can't tell you how many times I've called the police out. You know, watching somebody homeless park in either the front of my home or across the street where you're gonna have the park. Either homeless, teenage kids, smoking pot, doing drugs. I have woken up in the middle of the night having people wander around out there playing on drums and, and loud music and we don't even have a park there. They're accessing the, the park area from Kiwana Springs or walking down Merida, um, Mita, and even the review of, of the impact in the community. I'm really curious, since that was done, was that done prior to all the new development that's already taken place or that's taken place in the last couple of years right on Kiwana Springs and Petaluma Hills? You've got the buildings and then even now more structures that are being put up, and I don't know how many are in that particular corner, but that's all gonna have an impact. I call the police periodically. I call them more to be honest, but 90% of the time that I feel like I should be calling somebody, I know that they've seen me and I'm afraid that if a police officer shows up in front of my home, they're gonna know that I'm the one that's called. I'm right there on that creek edge. I see the kids go underneath the bridge. I see them, you know, they, they rob. I found wallet a wallet that didn't belong to anybody that was stolen, a stolen, stolen things. So they go under there, even if a cell phone that belonged to an officer. I picked up the cell phone, it was sitting on the bridge, made the phone call. Ironically, the person didn't lock their phone, but it was a Santa Rosa police officer and said, Thank you for calling me and letting me know that it's sitting here. He says, we had a robbery downtown Santa Rosa and the robber ended up taking my phone. So where did they go? They went in my front yard. So I don't really want to see a big park there. It's dangerous. Thank you, Marianne. Linda? Ian? And I'm slightly deaf, so my speech may not be very clear. I hope you'll bear with me. Um, the reason that I'm interested in this park is kind of unusual. I've been really um, looking for information on your earthquake preparedness in this uh, city since I've been here. I've been living here five years and I've been really interested. The fires made me even more interested. Um, we haven't had a major earthquake and one is coming. And I have water and they say that it may be up to six weeks before we have help from the outside when a major earthquake happens. I look at the water situation there and I go, it's electricity. What if electricity is down? How will we get water? Now, on my property, I can't store for each individual six weeks of water. I don't know very many people who even have a couple of days worth of water. We have so much water right underneath us everywhere we go that it's kind of ridiculous that we don't have some pump stations at our park that could be emergency water for us if we needed it. We have 200,000 people in this city who are gonna need water if there's a major earthquake and we don't have the power or any backup to give us that water we need. Most of us will have the food we need, but we will not have the water we need. 
It would be very easy if in every park we have a pump station, a hand manual pump station where people can come and get water if they need it. And um, so it's a wonderful park. I think they did a great job, but I think they need to add one more thing to it. And it's not something we may need tomorrow or the next day, but I tell you, if we ever do need it, we are gonna be so thankful if someone put that small funding in there, because it wouldn't cost that much to put pumping stations in our park for that kind of emergency. And last but not least, I love this city. I love the people who love the homeless. I love the people who, who put up with it all. You've shown a great deal of courage putting up with this homeless situation. You don't just throw them in jail. You care about the people. I think that's wonderful. But we do need toilets. We need toilets everywhere. It's a health concern for us all, you know. There are a raise in disease and trouble if people don't have a place to do it. You can't condemn somebody for taking a dump somewhere if there's no place to take a dump. And so the park, I worry about temporary toilets because anything that is temporary in can go as soon as the neighbor is complaining that the toilets are there and drawing the homeless. Let's Th put in thank real you so toilets. Much, Linda. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak on this item? Go ahead. Hold on one second. There you go. I live on Kiwana Terrace, just up where all of the construction is going on, uh, right across from where the children's village used to be. I walk past both your houses several times a week. Um, I actually am happy about the park. I'm excited about the park um, for the reasons of potential cleanup. Everything that they said is true. Um, I have three granddaughters that I do not allow in my own front yard to play, and I've got a split rail fence out front because of the speeding. And the youth that are up there that the, the lady spoke of is a daily round the clock problem. I have called it in. I've talked to Hank about it before he retired. Um, I put some information on your forum um, when it was offered. I'm excited about the park to have a place to go. I want to know how the city is going to partner with the, the proposal to keep crime down, to keep get rid of the RVs because, I mean, I, I don't want to bring my kids down there by myself without my husband. Um, I don't walk to Kiwana Springs or to uh, Taylor Park. Taylor Mountain by myself anymore. I can't walk from my house across from the children's village up to Taylor Mountain, which was one of the attractions to buying that home two and a half years ago. My home's about 59 years old. One of the first homes that was in the neighborhood and all of the other neighbors that I live around feel the same way. I literally wanted to go buy spike strips and put them in front of my yard to keep these teenagers and people from driving at least 60 miles an hour past my house every day, every day. I've been out there doing yard work and had to come back up on my sidewalk because of the speeding. I think a, a, a cross, not a crosswalk, but a stop sign needs to be where Mita is. Um, I mean, I've, I've had to take in my three grandkids, one of them in a stroller, and I mean, I don't do it anymore. It's not safe. The speeding is out of control. Um, I don't see police cars there very often, and I know several of the policemen that say that they've gone over there, and it's fine, but they're going past where all of the stuff is going on, going up and checking the parking lot and coming back down. It's illegal to drink and drive, right? But they're getting high, and then they're driving, and they're speeding past my house, and it's not safe. So how is the, how the RVs that are over there now? Where where are they going to go when you do all your cleanup and you move your boulders? Sorry, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Could you give your name one more time so that staff can reflect it in the minutes? I will give it to her. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak on this item? All right, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the council. 
Uh, are there any additional questions for staff? All right, Council Member Tibbetts, do you want to put a motion on the table? I move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa adopting a mitigated ne negative declaration, including a mitigation monitoring and reporting program for Kiwana Springs Community Park to include paved trails, community garden with portable restroom enclosure, parking, picnic areas, shade pavilions, children's play areas for ages two to five and five to 12, restroom building, bocce courts, dog park, bicycle pump track, half basketball court, table tennis, fitness stations, volleyball, multi-use turf area, pedestrian bridge, crosswalks and looped walking paths, and adopting the Kiwana Springs Community Park Master Plan and waive for the reading of the text. Second. Second. All right, are any comments from council? Council Member Combs, do you have any comments? No, just to thank staff for bringing it forward and to thank Arlie Haig for her continued work on community gardens in our area. I think that was ISAG uh, based on what was on the, the overhead, but uh, thank you, Arlie. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and go to a vote. Vice Mayor Rogers, your vote? Aye. Councilmember Combs? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Aye. Councilmember Oliveras? Aye. Councilmember Sawyer? Aye. Councilmember Tibbetts? Aye. So that will pass unanimously. Uh, thank you so much, Deputy Director. So we, as we announced earlier in the night, uh, item 14.4 has been pulled and held until next week, uh, where we will hear it then. We are going to take a quick 20 minute break uh, from the council. We've got about an hour and a half of, of uh, commentary and public comment uh, on the item 14.3. So we will come back at 7.50.
for a walk. And we're back. Mr. McGlynn, item 14.3. Item 14.3, public hearing, ordinance introduction, ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa modifying chapter 18-33 to adopt by reference with local amendments the 2019 California Energy Code Title 24 Part six of the Building Standards Code, All Electric Reach Code, and resolution setting a public hearing for adoption of the ordinance. Jesse Oswald presenting. Good evening, thank you. Uh, so some of this information is gonna look familiar. We've talked about it several times. Uh, some background on where the code comes from. We'll, we'll specifically make sure it's clear that this is only addressing the California Energy Code portion of the code adoption and locally known as a REACH code because we're adopting, uh, we're proposing adoption of more stringent requirements than the state uh, proposes. So uh, California Building Standards Commission uh, every three years uh, publishes new codes based on international codes. And here we are, this is the, the sequencing time of year, uh, time of the cycle to do it. Uh, the codes, the energy code is a statewide standard that all public and private building construction uh, in California will adhere to. The 2019 uh, energy code is uh, became actually officially published from the Building Standards Commission and the, the uh, California Energy Commission July 1st. So we've had this much time to actually go through the code and review what, what it actually means. So specifically, if we adopt this code, it would be effective July or January 1st, 2020. The, the energy code adoption, if we, if we implement more strict uh, standards than the base requirement has has a very specific uh, charge that lo local jurisdictions, if they amend the energy code to be more stringent, we have to make the finding that the amendments the amendments are supported with analysis showing that the pro proposed local standard uh, will be uh, more energy efficient and be cost effective. Uh, this is just to highlight the. California Energy Code is one portion of the overall 11 part code series. Some of the items that will be coming in with the adoption of the 2019 California Energy Code without local amendments, these changes will occur. These are some highlighted items. Uh, lighting efficiencies are increased yet again, which they were already pretty, pretty efficient. Uh, we will no longer likely see anything less than two by six exterior wall framing. There were methods in past codes to be able to do what was called performance, uh, to be able to do different types of measures to maybe do two by four framing. So this is now gonna almost dictate two by six exterior wall framing due to the high uh, energy uh, efficient insulation. Doors will be addressed for the first time in the codes, oddly enough. Uh, windows have been addressed for energy efficiency for a long time, doors never were. Um, certain specific quality inspections will, will be required on most uh, energy efficiency items in new construction. Uh, it, this continues to evolve to where third party inspections are now uh, gonna be more and more commonplace. Photovoltaic, known as solar, will be required uh, prescriptively, in other words, it's a base requirement of the code on all new low-rise residential construction, low-rise meaning three stories and below residential. And natural gas is not eliminated from the base code. It is still part of the efficiency package. 
This slide represents uh, the California Energy Commission's analysis for the actual base code adoption. This is not including the reach code, which we'll be discussing. Uh, they say that the, uh, they, through the analysis, have indicated that it, the initial cost is an additional $9,500 for a single family home and the payback is $19,000 over a 30-year mortgage. This was through the cost analysis that the state did. So some basics of a REACH code, as we've discussed a little bit in the past, um, the code of regulation sets building code standards for all jurisdictions, They're the, what we call typically the base code. Uh, our local governments can adopt more stringent requirements, not just for the energy code, but any of the codes. Uh, specific to energy, they have to be uh, proven to be cost effective, uh, they're required to have the public process, and if we were to adopt a REACH code, every time we want to continue a REACH code, we have to go through the process of public engagement and reanalysis, cost, cost effectiveness, and more energy efficient than the base code. So the options that we discussed in our, one of our Preliminary climate action uh, subcommittees. Uh, these were the three options present, presented. Uh, the all electric ready, which is essentially pre-wiring the house or, or the, the building, uh, if, it, if it's a duplex or what, what have you, to be ready to convert to all electric, but still they have the option to install gas. They, they have the the 100% choice, and there's no analysis that show any reduction in greenhouse gas because you just don't know when this may happen. The all electric favored is kind of the middle tier. Um, it allows for the choice for uh, gas fueled appliances, either gas or propane. But the trade off is if you go with a gas appliance, you have to increase the efficiency, what's commonly known as the Cal Green Tier 1, 10 to 20% more efficiency and other measures in the home. So you do a trade-off for each appliance of the typical four appliances. You increase the efficiency in some other element or elements to equal the efficiency lost by going with gas. And then the third option that uh, is before you is the all-electric reach which again requires all electric only, no natural gas or propane for the primary appliances in the home. In other words, the homes would not be plumbed with uh, natural gas or propane. Here's our carbon dioxide analysis that was done uh, through the, uh, our partners in uh, Bay Area Regional Climate Protection Authority, uh, Sonoma Clean Power, and our other agencies that tells what our basic 2016 code, which we are currently under, shows in the just over 3.5 uh, metric tons of carbon dioxide. The 2019 proposed codes drop that, just the base codes with no amendments, drops that down to just around three. Then if we go to the uh, higher efficiency 2019 codes that are coming, we still get a, a better reduction, and then the all electric only shows the significant reduction in carbon dioxide uh, production for maintaining a home. So on the right, we have the partners that we've worked with to gather all the technical information, the cost studies, uh, worked with the um, California Energy Commission, California Building Standards Commission, uh, so the cost analysis was required, it is required for the adoption of a code, uh, a REACH code. So it was reviewed by these agencies and it has been accepted by the California Energy Commission. So that, that has become the basis for us being able to tell the Energy Commission and the Building Standards Commission that we meet their requirements because they, they have already reviewed this and, and we're comfortable on a state level to be able to present this. This breaks down the actual cost effectiveness study that was, that was performed regionally uh, with partnering jurisdictions and our, our um, climate protection partners showing that essentially the $6,171 in cost savings, and this is 
This is generally across the state of California. It's not specific to any one jurisdiction. So they've taken into account the entire state. Uh, a matter of interest has been presented a few times during uh, our study sessions and uh, other uh, meetings. Uh, Assembly Bill 178 uh, was signed by the governor in September and essentially it boils down to it exempts homes that would normally be required to install photovoltaic solar systems which is coming in the base code regardless of what we do here. It exempts them from having to install those. The, I read the background on the law. The proposal is targeted to uh, relieve some of the costs with complying with code measures for rebuilding in declared emergencies. Uh, so this cost effectiveness study that we've used only analyzed through the entirety of the state the installation of photovoltaic systems as part of the energy efficiency. So by proxy, this allowance by the governor will exempt rebuilds from the all electric reach codes. And I, I do have support from our partners in the analysis of this. So some of our uh, outreach that we've, we've performed on the left, we have our typical uh, monthly building officials, RICO, Redwood Empire Association of Code Officials that we meet uh, monthly. Uh, we have a, a list of those counties and, and jurisdictions that we meet with, uh, continually discussing codes and the adoptions and, and amendments and trying to, as much as possible, show some consistency across jurisdictions so we're not standing out, uh, out on our own. Uh, some other meetings that we've had, we do have a regular uh, North Coast Builders Exchange meeting. Uh, it was targeted uh, with the rebuild in mind, but we've had a great forum with uh, several builders and the, and the Builders Exchange over, uh, gosh, a year and a half now. Uh, they've been a great conduit for us. Coffee Strong meeting, uh, we always get a lot of interest in those meetings. Uh, we bring them everything that we bring with ev to every meeting. Also the standing home meeting uh, for the coffee neighborhoods. We also did a forum with the Redwood Empire uh, Remodelers Association uh, last month, I believe it was. Uh, great turnout there. And then our other public outreach specifically targeting full public participation the first meeting with the Climate Action Subcommittee was in June, and we had our study session with both building and fire codes in July. Another uh, event put on by the North Coast Builders Exchange, which brought up a pretty large crowd. Uh, the, the title was, what do, what do these uh, codes, essentially these reach codes mean to you? Another Climate Action Subcommittee in September. Builder Roundtable, which was really well attended out at the UFO in September as well. And then we did that last study session in September uh, for building and fire code adoption. This is just a list, it, it indicates 50. This is of course, course not 50. Uh, we have an updated list that we can provide you for cities that have actually adopted or taken first steps in adopting some sort of a reach code. Uh, it, as we evolve in our discussions and, and uh, potential adoptions of codes, other jurisdictions are watching us and we're watching them as well. So uh, the Planning and Econo Economic Development Department, that's a mouthful, uh, re recommends that the City Council introduce an ordinance adopting by reference to 2019 California Energy Code, California Code of Regulations, Title 24, Part 6, as adopted and amended by the State of California and further amended based on local conditions for use in Chapter 18-33 of the Santa Rosa City Code. Uh, to modify the Santa Rosa City Code to reflect the new model code. Introduce an ordinance adopting by reference with local amendments, the 2019 California Energy Code, and adopt by resolution setting a public hearing for adoption of the ordinances. And we believe for December 3rd. All right, thank you. Uh, David, I'm going to start asking you a question. Uh, one of the main requirements in here that's obviously a linchpin is the cost effectiveness uh, analysis. And I noticed that in two different places we have two different criteria. 
One, it says over the life of the mortgage, and that seems to be on the state's requirements that are coming in that we'll obviously discuss more fully next week. Uh, you know, it shows that even with the photovoltaic systems coming in, that over the life of the 30-year mortgage, it would save uh, 9,500, uh, excuse me, $19,000. Then obviously we look at it on the REACH side, which is the one-time expense of the construction of the gas versus not having it. Can you talk a little bit about the distinction between how cost-effective is defined and how this meets that criteria? Sure, and Jessica can jump in here too um, if you want. The, the first one you mentioned was, again, for the base code, which uh, is defined by the state um, looking at what those, what those improvements will do to a homeowner's annual electricity bill by reducing their energy consumption, but also the energy loss in a home. So that's what this graphic represents. Um, so that's, that, that $19,000 of savings is, is, is primarily over the cost to the, the individual homeowner. On the flip side, when we start looking at the um, cost effectiveness study and the, the rationale that we have to provide the state to even have the conversation we're having tonight um, is to show that the the, the reach code elements uh, do uh, show it's cost effective, but also um, has a reduction in greenhouse gases. So we did show the greenhouse gas reduction element slide before this. The second is this, and this is actually just the infrastructure, so it doesn't take into account the ongoing savings to the homeowner. This is the cost to build and construct. And so as Jesse mentioned, this is uh, average over the state, um, and they look at four things. Really, a reach code is uh, looking at four appliances. is the heating and cooling. Um, the uh, um, water heating, dryers, and cooking. And so those are the four appliances that you can see here. Really, there's no cost difference in most of the appliances, except a little bit in the heat pump um, from moving from a t typical uh, heating and cooling system. The cost where they're showing the savings is really the uh, uh, the um, infrastructure putting the gas lines in. So not having to put those lines in shows a net uh, reduction in that one-time cost. Um, so that's the that's how we have to prove to the state, and this, this actually, this study came from the state, and that's, again, one of the reasons you're seeing us have this conversation, but also a lot of jurisdictions around the state having this conversation, because now there is a study that has been done to show this number that allows us to look at um, moving these, these items forward and, 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 and debating them. So. Um, again, I think to the clarification to your point, the first one really represents the cost to the homeowner, and this one represents the cost to the construction, which ultimately does get passed on to the homeowner um, through the construction process. Okay, great, thank you so much. So then this analysis, uh, folks should become familiar with it because I assume those 50 jurisdictions that are looking at this are all looking at the same numbers then. That's correct. And we're all using the same data. That's correct. Uh, and, Sue, I, I think there was an issue up in Windsor of a, a threatened lawsuit related to this. Can you speak to where that sits and how that might impact Santa Rosa? Um, certainly. the. Santa Rosa, we did receive a letter very similar to the letter that was received in Windsor. We have reviewed that. We have put together a full response, um, and we find that there is uh, no merit to a lawsuit under uh, California Environmental Quality Act. Again, I should have specified right at the outset that that was the basis for the lawsuit or potential lawsuit up in Windsor. But we have reviewed all that. We have put together materials, and we are very confident um, that uh, that there are no uh, issues that would um, lead to a, any successful litigation. I appreciate that, and I, I appreciate the clarification that it was on CEQA, uh, not based on the cost. Correct. Great. Um, have we, as a, a city and as staff, started to contemplate the implications of moving to the all-electric it, given the concerns about de-energization and the public safety power shutoffs? Yes, so that's obviously a, a big conversation that's happening. Um, one of the things that we've looked at is what what currently, how are residents currently impacted? So one of the things we're finding, we heard quite a bit, is a lot of appliances now, any of the new appliances being installed have electric starters, so even people with gas were affected by the power shutoff. Um, so one of the things that we're, we're evaluating is what does that long-term resilience look like from, regardless if you're on gas or electricity, um, how do we address that as a community? Um, and that's something that we're going to be looking at um, with uh, an effort up with uh, working with uh, Urban uh, ULI, Urban Land Institute, um, and our, um, the county as a whole. 
um, how does our electrical grid system um, look from a sustainable standpoint or, or long-term resilience standpoint? Um, but as I mentioned, this I think that's an issue regardless of, of this dis decision tonight, um, because even with this decision tonight, we still have a large portion of our population that uh, will remain on the existing infrastructure, the existing gas system, the existing electrical grid um, that we have to address. So it's definitely top of mind and something that we'll be looking at over the next year or so. Yeah, so regardless of how the council votes, we'll end up needing a full response to the public policy challenge that's been presented. Great. Um, Jesse, if I could just, uh, so what I heard from you is it's cheaper, uh, rebuilds are exempted, correct? Correct. Uh, existing homes are not impacted. Correct. Anything that is built that is uh, above four, stor four stories or above is not impacted. Correct. Right. Thank you so much. Councilor, are there any additional questions? Councilmember Fleming. Thank you for doing a robust community engagement. Can you speak to your experience with uh, folks in the Fountain Grove area? Um, I'm, making sh I'm wondering if they're clear on that this would not affect their rebuilds and also in uh, Happy Hidden Valley. It's been a little more challenging with the uh, engagement with the Fountain Grove community. Uh, we haven't had any engagement with them for a few months. The last ones, I think, that we were at the same ones. Mm -hmm. um, we do work through our builders that we we meet with on a regular basis, so they are carrying the message forward for us. Um, but they have um, they're they're very. Uh, not shy about discussing with their with their builders what they want and don't they're, want. They're not shy folks, but I'm just wondering if we had given them similar outreach or courtesy um, that we have in. I can say that all of our outreaches were broadcast through the entire city and region, so we didn't isolate to any specific rebuilds or, or otherwise. Glad to hear it, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, as I mentioned, we have quite a few cards on this, so I will open the public hearing. I'm gonna ask folks to limit your comments to two minutes, and uh, feel free to not take up all of that. So we'll start with Andy Ferguson, followed by Laura Nish. Council, I'm Andy Ferguson. I'd like to, two minutes is a short time, but I'd like to say, uh, tell you that in my career, I worked as a engineer and I speak Asian languages, so I spent a lot of that in Asia. When I was freezing to death in North, some northern place in Japan or China, I tumbled, I learned about heat pumps. And when I came back to the United States, I decided that in order to, um, you know, go green with panels, with solar panels, I should put in heat pumps too. My second career after working as a engineer in Asia was as a builder. I built apartment buildings and I also purchased apartment buildings. And I did all of those at a full electric, 100% electric basis. I installed heat pumps in the units and they turned out to be the best investment I could have made. Not only do the tenants love them because they have both heating and cooling, they're far less expensive to operate and it was a very good business decision for me to do that. I joined the American Geophysical Union in order to learn more about climate science, and I've been going to their conventions of 20,000 scientists in San Francisco every year, the fall meeting in December. At those places, I've learned about the severe threat that methane represents in the climate. I have a quick graphic to show you about that. This graphic, the top line, this graphic shows the total impact of carbon dioxide and methane on the climate. The top line is the impact of carbon dioxide on global warming and climate change. The bottom line is the impact of methane. The difference is, and for policymakers, is that we can stop put, putting methane into the atmosphere and make a real difference. Carbon dioxide will be there for 300 years, but the methane 20, thank you. Thank you so much. Laura Nish, followed by Kevin Conway. Uh, Laura is not here, I'll put her card off to the side. Kevin, followed by Jeff Stewart. 
Um, Kevin Conway with Friends of the Climate Action Plan. There, I was really glad to hear uh, City Attorney Gallagher mention that um, she felt confident about lawsuits related to CEQA. I have heard that there's talk about another type of lawsuit, a slap lawsuit, strategic lawsuit against uh, public participation. Uh, these lawsuits against cities trying to protect their uh, citizens against the ravages of climate change uh, should be seen as ridiculous as a lawsuit against our government for trying to uh, protect us against terrorism. Any money that we save by avoiding such a lawsuit won't mean much in light of the money that we're going to be spending trying to recover from the ongoing catastrophes that our cities already face and will continue to face as this crisis gets uh, worse. Let's face it, no terrorism uh, or terrorist group could ever threaten our city and, and the world more than the climate crisis does, and no lawsuit uh, should ever deter us from doing uh, what is right and what has to be done. I wanted to thank um, Council Member Tibbetts for mentioning uh, the Oakmont Village Association working on a microgrid and his encouraging of the Climate Action Subcommittee to follow their progress on that. I would like to see our Climate Action Subcommittee meet uh, at least <clears throat> on a monthly basis. Since the committee was established during the goal setting sessions in the beginning of the year, uh, they've only met three times and here we are in November. So it feels like uh, we're not really acting as though we're, we're in a crisis and I'd like to see that changed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So Jeff Stewart followed by Deborah. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, my name is Jeff Stewart. I'm uh, president of Blue Star Gas, a, a local propane distributor. Been in business 81 years. Um, I'm a third generation in the business. As a business owner in Santa Rosa and a longtime resident who, like with all of us, experienced power shutoffs and forced evacuations, energy security is extremely important. Energy security comes from energy diversity. And unless there are redundant systems in place, no amount of electricity, renewable or conventional, will provide the certainty that the residents of the city of Santa Rosa require to provide adequate protection of lives, safety, and health in disaster settings. Energy is more than just a convenience. For some, power is a critical necessity. Propane and natural gas provide life-sustaining energy for our elderly population, for oxygen generators or those that require charging of wheelchairs. Firefighters use propane to power their base camps, to cook food, wash clothes, take hot showers. Cell phone towers rely on propane as backup power. Hospitals, water treatment facilities, electric utilities, and even electric utilities. The city of Santa Rosa uses propane as backup power for the sewage lift stations. So help me understand City Council members, why you would allow and require energy diversity for the most critical city infrastructure needs and not provide the same level of energy security options to our citizens. If the Council adopts this REACH code, you will be eliminating customer choice of critical alternative energy redundancy, require infrastructure and electricity that is an unreliable single point of failure and requiring more expensive to the tune of set $1,000 a year more for electricity. Thank you, sir. Natural. Deborah, followed by Peter Gang. Deborah? Okay, we'll go with Peter, followed by Tony White. Good evening, uh, Vice Mayor. Council members, my name is Pete Gang. I am a builder, architect. Um, I've been at this game for nearly 40 years. And I just wanted to say, like all the other builders who I assume are in the room, the whole design community, when I started out in my career, natural gas was the, the clean, safe alternative. We were doing everything we could to heat cool power our build not cool but heat power our buildings with natural gas and move away from electricity back then we knew very little about the climate crisis and 
we, times have changed. Slowly over the last several years, we have learned about the climate crisis and to say that we have underestimated its, its scope and reach is itself a huge understatement. Over the last 10 years or so, we have learned about the human caused greenhouse gas, the human caused greenhouse gases. And more recently, we now know that methane, which is the primary component of natural gas, is itself a potent greenhouse gas, which on an annual basis is over 100 times more damaging than CO2. That doesn't get much airplay, but that is one of the main motivations behind us wanting to get away from natural gas and move toward all electric. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Tony White, followed by Hal Beck. Hal? He'll be followed by Amy Bolton. I'm disappointed Tony White isn't here. I was hoping to hear what he had to say. Um, personally, I am um, understand this is probably a done deal. I personally can't see a single reason why the Santa Rosa City Council would uh, prohibit natural gas hookups for new connections. Uh, electro, electrical energy is not reliable. I think we all have seen that over the last couple of months. I think we're gonna continue to see it. Um, natural gas and propane are. Um, those who had gas or propane could cook in heat during those cutoffs. Uh, those who do not, could not. Um, electric energy is not carbon neutral. It's not carbon free. I always enjoy those emission free stickers on the cars. Um, it kind of is just like uh, people who believe that uh, milk comes from the grocery store. You had a nice house there in one of your graphics showing uh, the, uh, the, the uh, emissions coming off of that house, gas versus electric, and then are the power lines going back. Didn't show the power lines uh, that create emissions that uh, two, a year ago with the uh, campfire gave us the worst air quality in the Bay Area in the world. We were ahead of Peking and we were ahead of Mumbai. And it wasn't caused by, uh, it certainly wasn't caused by cows farting methane. It was caused by the transmission of electricity. So that, that, that graphic that shows this is how the efficiency of the house is, uh, is doesn't include the transmission and the risks that go with it. Um, we've been using fire for what, 500,000, maybe 2 million years. Uh, that's how we learn to cook and heat our caves. That's been our basic source and has a lot to create a uh, civilization. Um, and chefs don't use electric cooking. You use natural gas. Electric cooking is for hot plates. Fine electricity as a reliable source that could Thank cost you, your life. If Thank you. you uh, Amy Bolton, followed by Ben Granholm. Hey, good, good evening. Um, Amy Bolton, I'm, I'm with Christofferson Builders. I'm here partially in that capacity and partially as a resident lifelong of Santa Rosa. Um, new homes built today, as we mentioned, are light years ahead of energy efficiency. New homes construction, which are a teeny tiny sliver of our housing stock, light years ahead of energy efficiency um, than existing housing stock. And the new 220 energy codes are gonna increase that by half. Like, so these houses are already gonna be so incredibly efficient. Um, in Sonoma Clean Power offers really great incentives. It's a great program in order to keep, have people go all electric if they want to. But here's the point, oh, okay. <laughs> um, here, here's the point where this gets a little personal. You know, we do talk to a lot of our customers, and I know that the rebuilds are exempt from this, which is which is great. Mm -hmm. You can feel better, but um, they also represent the sentiment of just the general public who are going to be looking to buy new homes. And I have to tell you, like most of them are very not happy about the thought of having this crammed down their throat, not being able to have you know a gas um, 
a gas stove or a gas water heater or whatever. So that could be an issue in the future. And then also, yeah, during the last power outages, my whole neighborhood, we were out for a week. And I'm telling you, without having the hot water and being able to cook on our stove, just use a little lighter and um, the little, you know, gas the little gas fireplace we have, it would have been miserable with two kids. I mean, it was just a horrible quality of life. And so I wouldn't be surprised if the state looks at revising that. And just given the fact this is our new reality, um, I really do think we should think twice about pushing this so quickly, so fast. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. Ben, followed by Joy, I, I apologize, Alafia. Uh, good evening, Mr. Vice Mayor and Council Members. My name is Ben Granholm of the Western Propane Gas Association. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment this evening. Uh, WPGA supports clean energy. However, we do believe that the all-electric reach code before you this evening is fundamentally flawed, uh, specifically the inclusion of propane in the definition of all-electric building or design. Uh, the propane industry is proud of the role that we play in providing a low-cost clean energy to rural communities. Uh, when we look at the electricity pricing forecast provided by California regulatory agencies, it's pretty evident that their work does not factor in the fragility of California's electric grid and other infrastructure and liability costs uh, that are ultimately passed on to ratepayers. PG&E was recently granted the ability to increase rates 23% over the next three years, uh, and electricity prices are going to continue to skyrocket while ratepayers are left with an unstable and unreliable electrical, electrical grid and energy source. Uh, whereas propane can provide clean energy uninterrupted uh, at a cheaper rate than electricity. Over the past couple months, we've seen millions of residents across California, many of which were right here in Santa Rosa, uh, left in the dark due to power safety shutoffs. These occurrences, which are expected to continue for at least the next 10 years, are a prime example as to why relying on a single energy source is dangerous and unacceptably risky. Uh, clean energy solutions should not have to compete against one another when they can often complement each other. In order for solar to be successful, it needs to have backup power. And battery storage is not yet mature as price and performance vary wildly, costing tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, lastly, I'd like to question the report that it's cheaper to build an electric home versus gas. Uh, this analysis does not factor in the cost for fitting a new home for propane. There's no significant price differential uh, between building and propane. Thank you, sir. Joy, followed by Alex Gallard. Hey, Art. Addressing climate change should not be a, a contentious, dichotomous discussion. We should not demonize one clean energy solution while favoring another. Instead, we should look at the science on how to address climate change. Look at the full energy cycle, not just an elitist lens that pushes the greenhouse gas emission burdens to another community. I'd like to emphasize that propane is not methane. Again, propane is not methane. Renewable propane is just one of the innovations at your disposal to fight climate change. An E3 report used to inform the CEC lists renewable gas as carbon neutral. CARB has also identified renewable propane as on par or having a lower carbon footprint than electricity. Look at the report from Dr. Ernest Moniz, physicist and former energy secretary under Barack Obama. The gist of his report is all clean fuels, including renewable gaseous fuels, must effectively be used to address climate change. There is an additional challenge with an electric-only proposition. Cal ISO, Cal ISO electric grid operators advise that the state's backup power supply is in danger of being depleted in 2020, requiring more polluted electricity from other out-of-state or dirtier in-state uh, plants. Adopting this plan would willingly create an energy desert for Santa Rosa residents. Rather than the community Rather than committing the city to adopting a well-intentioned but deeply uh, premature, highly risky sole energy proposition, all energy uh, solutions must be embraced. I submit that perhaps propane was not properly evaluated. This is why San Luis Obispo elected to exclude propane from the proposition. Santa Rosa cannot afford a symbolic gesture uh, for clean energy. I humbly would also submit that the staff proposal to look at wildfire resilience should be unacceptable to Santa Rosa residents. Thank you. 
Thank you. Alex, followed by Chris Thompson. Good evening, council members. My name is Alex Gallard. I am a Santa Rosa resident and I'm an employee of Blue Star Gas. Despite the colossal nightmare our region recently experienced with wildfires and blackouts, the city around Santa Rosa City Council is blindly pushing ahead with a proposal to create a precedent for an un all electric community. This well-intentioned but misinformed drive to electrify everything will reap a harvest of regret and deprivation while exposing citizens to otherwise avoidable life and death risks. If implemented, the policy could literally lead to untold fatalities in worst case scenarios, especially for those who rely on life-sustaining medical equipment. The proposal is devoid of common sense and ignores the fact that electrifying everything creates a single point of failure with no plan B. The council needs to step back from the precipice and consider the following realities. One, electricity is not a silver bullet. It is dangerous to assume that all buildings and homes should be electric only because every other type of energy is somehow bad. The reality is that the act of generating electricity creates 16% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. Two, energy diversity is vital. It is a risky proposition to put all the energy eggs in a single basket. From grid failures to hackers, California would be highly vulnerable to blackouts without any other options. Three, Buildings are just a small source of greenhouse gas emissions. The California Air Resource Board estimates that the building sector accounts for just 9% of the state's total greenhouse gas emissions today. At best, total electrification of the residential sector would only decrease total greenhouse gas emissions by about 2%. And four, the council ignores the environmental values of alternative fuels such as propane. Propane is a decentralized source. It is not susceptible to wildfire uh, preparedness shutoffs. Propane is the only energy source to provide reliable, sustainable backup power. Propane is becoming even more sustainable with the introduction of renewable propane. Thank you for your time. Chris Thompson, followed by Keith Woods. Good evening. My name is Chris Thompson, and I'm the vice chair of the Oakmont Democratic Club. The Kincaid Fire and PG&E power shutoff of a few weeks ago marks the third year in a row that we here in Sonoma County have experienced California fire emergencies. It is clear that our community is indeed very vulnerable to the disastrous effects of global climate change. But we are not helpless. Today, we can take an important step in fighting this climate emergency by implementing the electric reach code for new housing this code will help ensure that by using only electric appliances in new homes and multi-story residences of four stories or less, we eliminate the need for natural gas, a dangerous contrib contributor to greenhouse gases as the methane present in natural gas worsens the already deadly effects of carbon dioxide in our air. While some argue that the REACH code costs too much and limits building choices, we see that in 2019, this claim is no longer valid. Science warns us that we have less than 10 years to address the climate tipping point. We are in a state of emergency. We are running out of time. Electric homes are the future we need for ourselves and especially for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you, Keith Woods, followed by Craig Lawson. Thank you, Keith Woods, I'm the CEO of uh, North Coast Builders Exchange. We have close to 900 uh, builders, so I get an earful on this and uh, the pros and the cons, and uh, overwhelmingly, uh, our position is uh, th this is just too much for too little results. This will make you feel good, it sounds good, but I hope you'll make fact-based decisions uh, rather than emotion-based decisions. Uh, this is my fourth entity uh, that now I've, uh, 
I've been at meetings. So one in Windsor, it was a Deb Fudge, Sam Salmon Railroad, uh, facts be damned. Uh, the propaganda that was put out by Sonoma Clean Power and the Climate Authority was all they needed to hear. I went up to Healdsburg. They've taken a middle ground. Uh, the middle ground is they, they wanted a carrot and a stick. The, uh, <clears throat> they took the all electric favored, meaning you will have gas and electric hookup, uh, but you need to offset the gas with high energy efficiency appliances for uh, heating and for water, but you'll still be able to have your cooking and your fireplace, because they realize those future home buyers are not gonna like this. Trust me and trust the builders in the room who can tell you this is not a popular concept. And if you do think it's that great, well, uh, put it on the ballot and make it mandatory for uh, retrofitting all of them, if it's that hot of an idea. I went to the county today and the supervisors decided you know what, uh, uh, th th there's enough, there's too much we don't know about this. And so they've deferred it. They adopted the state codes, but they have deferred this decision and said, come back later. Let's give homeowners a chance more than five or six weeks uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to get a home started. Finally, um, the article uh, that was in the Press Democrat called All Electrics Time Will Come, But It Isn't Here Yet, ought to be mandatory reading by those who are in the decision making. Thank you, Keith. Craig Lawson, followed by Keith Christofferson. Mr. Vice Mayor, members of the council. Uh, by the way, I gave a handout. She's, I think, going to pass it out to you right now. It's really big handwriting, so it's really easy to read. There are 11,502,870 households in the state of California. On average, we build about 80,000 new homes in the state of California. So that means that 0.0069% of new housing stock is contributing to the overall housing stock. New homes utilize 96% efficient furnaces and water heaters, sealed combustion condensing type, as mandated by the current energy codes. 87% of the housing stock in California was built prior to 1980. In 1978, the California Energy Commission came into existence and started developing new standards, which we all live by today. Homes built prior to 1980 have 78% or worse efficient furnaces, 67% or worse efficient water heaters. Simple math, new homes are therefore producing 0.0016% of greenhouse gases. That's one ten thousandth of 1%. By the way, I provided some housing statistics by fuel type for you for reading. Finally, the residential Housing contributes 7% of the greenhouse gases in the state of California is not accurate. It, the, the quote of 27% of your report was, was not accurate. My references are all from the California Air Resources Board from August. It would seem to me by focusing your energy on efforts on in, industrial and transportation, cost effective one ten thousandth of 1%. Thank you, sir. Keith Christofferson, followed by Tom Conlon. What I have to address is already been put in front of you tonight, <clears throat> but I'd like to reemphasize, we're working with all, the only people working for are rebuild clients. And we've had lengthy discussions with, with the people we're building for and the people we will be build, building for. This is over, this is over a hundred families, well over a hundred families. And uh, Keith Woods talked about uh, Healdsburg, and what what Keith said about the concern being the the cooking, <clears throat> pardon me, the cooking and the fireplace is absolutely correct. The only thing that he missed was barbecues, and uh, so really, if uh, people want the gas for for their cooking, they want it for their barbecues, and they want it for their fireplaces. It's really that simple. And I think there's a there's a a public education process that needs to be gone through. 
I have no doubt in my mind that the future is going to be electric for heat and uh, for water and, and all of the other utilities, but there's, there is such a, a lack of, of knowledge within the general public that this is a very hard sell. And it's, uh, it's backing, people feel like they're being backed into a corner. And I think that uh, the next step needs to be this uh, public information program. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Conlon, followed by Bryce Pattison. Thank you, Tom Conlon, uh, Sierra Club, Sonoma Group. Uh, first, I wanna thank staff and the Climate Action Subcommittee for all the hard work that I know has gone into this over the past six months at least. Um, and especially your pains at uh, reflecting the diversity of opinion, you know, going out and expanding your outreach when concerns rose, but then remaining focused on the facts and not bogged down by some of the fears you hear expressed in the room tonight. If any community has received the memo that the age of business as usual is over, it is this one, it is this city. So I wanna thank you in advance for your vote tonight in support of the all electric reach code. In the great scope of things, this is actually a pretty easy vote for you to take because the building sector is performing pretty well. And it's be precisely because we're asking a lot of our builders. Every three years, we ask them to adopt the new technologies that are coming out of our amazing innovation economy. And they do it, and they do it successfully. And we appreciate their, their efforts. And this is, this is what we have in front of us tonight, is that the all electric era is dawning here. And by the way, the cost effectiveness study that Misty Bruceri has done for you, I was in class with Misty at Sonoma State University about 27, 28 years ago. And there's no one I can think of more qualified or more has more integrity to do a cost study like the one in front of you tonight. Now, you've also heard complaints that uh, somehow propane is a clean fuel. Uh, that is simply not true. Propane is a fossil fuel. It leaks, I think, in, in many ways because it's so distributed a uh, distribution system, the leakage in the propane system, we don't even know what it is. The research, frankly, hasn't been done because propane is such an insignificant amount of the entire energy profile. So I, I just hope the, prop, the uh, AB 178 exemption people aren't too angry that they didn't. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Bryce Pattison, followed by Amy Ryder. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bryce Pattison. I'm the CEO of Associated Propane, and we service the Santa Rosa area. I'd like to share with you some benefits of propane as a clean alternative energy source. Climate change is a complex challenge, and there's no silver bullet. Wind, solar, and renewable propane will all have to factor in the equation of how to combat one of the most critical issues of our time. As we have seen over the past couple of weeks with the power safety shutoffs, over 2 million people were impacted, and many of those who live in all electric homes and drive electric vehicles were stranded with no power and no transportation. By going all electric, you're putting all your eggs in one basket and putting an incredible strain on an already unreliable electric grid. Just two weeks ago, PG&E CEO Bill Johnson advised the PUC that it could take 10 years to fully strengthen the grid to the point where shutoffs are minimal. This community cannot afford to have interrupted power for 10 years. Propane customers have reliable power. We heard from countless propane users who reported how thankful they were for their propane generator, which provided continuous power for them in the face of blackouts. I wish to share a couple of propane stories and testimonials. A customer named George shared, and I quote, Last year, after I was out of power for six days, I was frustrated. I bought a 30 kilowatt generator to run my whole house, and I am so happy to feel part of civilization now that the power is out. I am not happy with my power provider, PG&E, and their lack of care if we have power. One of my most important decisions in deciding on my generator is that I wanted a clean fuel. I wanted to be able to have my computer as I needed information throughout the day. I am an engineer, and I know how important it is to have a fuel that is good for our environment. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Amy? 
Yes, good evening. Thank you, Vice Mayor and Council. Appreciate it, your time. I'm a local energy and sustainability consultant. And I just wanted to um, kind of reiterate what you said, Vice Mayor Rogers, that uh, all electric is cheaper, cleaner, safer, and better for the climate. And I really uh, appreciated your succinct summary of that because I don't see a downside here. And in fact, uh, we, we know we're in a climate crisis and more than anything, why would we want to contribute further to it? I see this as a very simple first step to, to no longer contribute to the problem um, as a first step of taking our foot off the accelerator before we can even slow down. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else who'd like to address on this issue? Go ahead. Make sure you identify yourself for, uh, for, for the clerk. I'm Mike Turgeon, uh, Friends of the Climate Action Plan. Thank you, Vice Mayor and Council. Uh, I wanna thank the builders in particular for what they've accomplished in the last two years, helping our victims of the fire from the Tubbs fire uh, to rebuild in such a uh, responsible and diligent way. And I'd like to thank the City Council for coming so far this last year by elevating the climate crisis to a tier one priority, forming a climate subcommittee and investigating the REACH code uh, and all the angles and everything that goes along with it. It's, it's been quite a slog to get there. Um, the fossil fuel arguments are pretty cogent for 1990 maybe, 2010 perhaps, but we have got no time left. Our carbon budget is gone and methane, what we're learning about it is so toxic and such a multiplier of carbon that uh, this seems like a small step, but it's a step. And we've come quite this far, and this will be the beginning of many difficult decisions that are gonna be made. But we would count on the council to take the broadest view possible on keeping our citizens safe, and there's no broader view than what's happening to us in the midst of the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Hello, uh, my name is Justin Glover. I'm a, a resident in Petaluma, uh, actually in, a, in an arch practicing architect. Um, the, the main point I think that I, I wanna make here after hearing uh, every all, all the, the uh, prior comments is just that we have one big global problem and that's the climate crisis that we're in right now. And this whole, this whole effort, especially on a state basis by setting these emission goals, whose target is completely through the code and through them asking local jurisdiction, jurisdictions like you to uh, to address these reach codes is to get to that big problem. That big problem is then creating these other smaller problems like the fires and the flooding and the hurricanes and all these other things, right? So this, these, these, these issues of like, hey, let's deal with the smaller problems that are a result of the bigger problem, I don't think makes sense. I think you have to look at the base level argument. You have to say, what is the big problem that's causing all these other issues? And I, I think that that is very clear. Um, and I, I just want to uh, express to council that um, this this piece is really on your shoulders. Um, they, it, the, the state has set these goals and then given a code that doesn't quite get there and then asked jurisdictions like you to be the people that really pushes the finish line so we can actually achieve those emissions uh, goals. Um, so I, I, in addition to being kind of coming here tonight, I've gone through um, a few other jurisdictions around the state, uh, the similar meetings like this. And uh, one thing I would say is that there is, um, there are a lot of jurisdictions that are considering this, this option right now. And I think a lot of jurisdictions around here are gonna look to Santa Rosa for leadership um, on this issue. And I think this is an opportunity for um, for you to, to prove to prove that and to be a leader in, uh, in the in the uh, Northern California. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yep. Anybody else? All right, I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the council. Uh, council Member Combs, I apologize, I forgot to ask if you had any questions before we opened the public hearing. Thank you. Uh, I do have a couple of questions and I appreciate the opportunity to ask them before we go on. Um, and thank you, staff, for bringing this 
to us uh, over time. Uh, I think we've been talking about it a very long time, and I, I appreciate it coming forward. Um, can anyone in Santa Rosa have a propane gas grill that they use outside under this code? Does this code ban having a gas grill outside? The ordinance does not affect the installation of propane uh, appliances if you use portable uh, propane uh, cylinders. So you use the, the, the tanks or cylinders of propane. That's true also if you have a gas generator, uh, if you use a propane gas generator and you have a portable tank. Correct, and you could, it doesn't, it also does not prohibit the installation of a larger propane tank for the use of a generator. The REACH code does not address generators. Okay, um, just as an aside comment, uh, uh, in my home in Santa Rosa, I recently installed a um, induction uh, cooktop, and I, I'm really very happy with it. In my second home uh, in Ecuador, I have a propane gas cooktop that was in the house that, I, that I'm in um, when I moved into it. And the, uh, um, it's filled by a tank. And there was recently a strike here um, on uh, tra a transit strike, uh, transportation workers went on strike and blocked all the roads, and the canisters couldn't be delivered. Uh, so while I'm hearing folks express concern about uh, the failure of electricity and the problems associated with electricity, we, we shouldn't be making the assumption that there will always be uh, propane delivery as well, uh, because we just uh, experienced uh, uh, a weekend of, of uh, no propane delivery and a lot of people ran out of propane here. Um, so there are some advantages to um, uh, expanding one's horizons with travel. Um, I, would, I would strongly uh, support uh, moving forward with the REACH code uh, and thank you very much. Uh, to the Friends of the Climate Action Plan for um, their help in um, educating and uh, making sure that we understand the details of what our Climate Action Plan calls on us to do. Uh, and, and this is one of those things. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, so I'm gonna make sure we put a motion on the table here for discussion. Uh, the motion coming from the Climate Action Plan or Action Subcommittee uh, was to adopt the REACH codes. Uh, Council Member Fleming, uh, do you wanna make a motion for discussion? Yes, yeah, so tonight we have two motions before us. I'll start with the introduction of the ordinance and wait for a second. Ordinance of the City of Santa Rosa adopting by reference with local amendments the 2019 California Energy Code, including all electric, low rise, residential reach code, and wait for the reading of the text. Second. Okay, I'm gonna start at this end. Council Member Tibbetts. One question I have for staff is, uh, we were getting some comments about propane versus natural gas, and I appreciate the question. Uh, Councilwoman Combs asked relative to using propane in the backyard. It sounds like that is not an issue and that was my understanding as well. Um, but we do not run propane through our appliances at home, correct? That is natural gas. Correct, we use typically natural gas in our incorporated area. And my understanding is that natural gas is predominantly comprised of methane, including other gases that includes propane. Is that, do we understand that to be true? Maybe that's, I don't know, getting too deep, but I just wanna, I guess, clarify this and debunk this a little bit because when I heard that uh, propane is a clean fuel, that's my understanding as well because it's predominantly comprised of ethane and, um, oh gosh, uh, butane, which I think are more refined fuels that are cleaner burning, but that's not what we're talking about. And I just wanna highlight that point. 
we're talking about natural gas and those do have dirty components to them. Um, you know, for me, uh, this is, I, I'm trying to find a reason why not. I have not heard uh, folks who are um, in opposition to this measure uh, state that the construction costs were higher and if this is a public hearing and they can address that, I would be interested in hearing it. Um, but what I'm hearing from the research of our staff, research that I've done, coming from empirical sources, including the California Energy Commission, I'm hearing that it is cheaper to build, it is greater cost savings for the residents over a 30-year mortgage, it exempts fire rebuilds, which we, I think, could all agree up here is very important to this council. Um, and to me, I think slide eight was perhaps the most compelling, and that was the fact that uh, by taking this action, it's 1.9 million, million tons. Was it a million tons or metric tons? Metric. Metric, okay, that makes more sense. Uh, 1.9 metric tons less than, than the other alternatives. And you know, and when I, we, we talk about climate change, it's gonna be a pain in the butt. You know, I, I like to drive a 1989 Ford F-250 seven liter V8 that gets about eight miles to the gallon. Um, but, you know, my next truck was gonna be a Dodge Ram 2500 diesel. I like the way they sound, I like the power that they have. That's not where my life is going. I'm gonna be getting an electric truck or electric car when they come out because I believe that's the change that's necessary in this world. It's painful, it's not what we're used to, it's not necessarily what we want, but I do think it's the change that has to happen. Um, so I'll be supporting this measure and I look forward to hearing what my colleagues think. Councilmember Fleming? Okay, I'll come down here, Councilmember Olivares. Thank you. Uh, again, thanks for, to staff for all the work that you've done on this. And I, I too appreciate the exemptions for the 2017 fire rebuild. I think that is very important. A lot of good research and thank you for pointing out uh, slide eight because that's also gravitated towards me as well. Uh, and I guess it's, for me it's kind of a matter of uh, when this is gonna happen. I think this is, uh, it, it is a small step and it's also a first step. And for me, I'm looking into the future, not necessarily for my life, but I'm looking forward to what's going to be happening in my grandchildren's lives. You know, they're uh, four and six years old right now, and for me, it's it's looking at that vision for them and what the world's going to be like for them. I don't know what kind of fuel they're going to be using by the time they're adults and buying their homes, uh, but for me, uh, I, I don't see a reason why not uh, to take this first step at this time, so I will be supporting this. Councilmember Sawyer. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Was the um was propane evaluated as far as it's, um, as, an, as a compromise or as an option, uh, as opposed to saying no? Was it, was it evaluated as, a, as one of the options? Because I haven't heard, except in this audience tonight, I haven't heard anything, or didn't read anything about propane. I have received a fair amount of, a number of emails. And the reason for my question is that I am concerned about a single energy solution. Um, and what I've been hearing about the, the danger of, of um, methane in our, in our atmosphere, and I, I am concerned about this, um, uh, a lack of energy diversity. When, it, when I see what's going on with, uh, with, the, with the shutoffs, um, it does concern me. So I'm wondering what was evaluated as far as propane. So propane was included um, in the evaluation when we looked at the three different alternatives. So we looked at the electric ready, which would have allowed a propane in addition. Uh, we looked at the uh, electric favored, which would allow propane um, as an option. And then the all electric reach, would, which eliminated natural gas and propane. And so direction was given to look at the, and bring forward an all electric reach code. So at that point, that was a decision point to move towards what we're bringing to you tonight. So propane was part of the conversation on those first two, um, and that's, that's when it was talked about. Okay, so I'll tell you where I'm, where I'm coming from. And I don't have children, but my, I do have great, great nieces and nephews. Um, the decisions that we make today, um, they will have to live with uh, in the future. Um, at the same time, what I'm, what I'm hearing is that the, the, the evil creature in the room is methane and that propane does not 
contain methane, at least in any in, in, a, in an amount that would be damaging to our to our environment. So I'm having a hard time saying no to um, energy diversity, and I'm just so I'm, I'm struggling with this because um, I, will, I have I have natural gas at home, um, and it allowed me to have a you know a, a reasonably um, normal existence during the power shutoffs. Um, had I had propane, um, I would have been able to enjoy the the, the use of that um, and also be reasonable, be responsible as far as the environment. So I'm um, I'm having a hard time eliminating propane as an option. And I understand the recommendation of the of the subcommittee, um, and it's I, I think it's it is a to me a, a little unfortunate that that it was um, that it was dismissed um, out of hand, and that the electric reach was um, embraced completely without offering a um, this diversity that I think is is really important for um, homeowners and the community. So um, I'm not I'm I'm not sure where my where my finger is going to go on this on on the board um, when I vote because um, it's not an option. I mean I, it's so my the, my option has been removed, um, and by saying no, um, I I'm sending a message that I don't want to send. Um, and if I say yes, I'm eliminating that energy diversity that I think is so important. So I'm I am um, I'm conflicted. So I have seconds to think about what I'm going to do. Councilmember Fleming. Yeah. So I want to um, thank everybody for the robust community outreach and for you know on both sides that people have come forward to speak about what is important to them. And I think that um, I've made no bones about it that what's important to me is making sure that my child has a safe place that she can live. And I'm increasingly concerned that I may not get to the end of my lifetime with a safe place to live. So, um, with, you know, with that being said, you know, I, I hear the um, concerns about propane, but I also know that there is solid research out there that while it is clean, it is, um, there are challenges with its combustion and um, the, they're well documented and we don't have time necessarily to get into that tonight. That was not the charge um, that we led with. But the other thing that I would add is that one of the criticisms here is that this only would get us one or 2% toward our goals, uh, but one or 2% is, is not insignificant. One or 2% adds up pretty quickly, especially if you've got a public employee pension. I mean, one or 2% is good. And we need to go around collecting one or two percent in every nook and cranny we can. I'd frankly settle for less. So uh, that's where I'll be going with this one. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, there was a comment that was made in, in public comment that this is too much. Oh, sorry, uh, Council Member Combs, did you have additional comments? Council Member, you might be on mute. I, I didn't. I did conclude my comments for the most part. I, I didn't feel that the recommendations were out of hand out of the committee. I think we've been really struggling with this one for a while. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Vice Mayor, for moving us forward. Okay, great. So what I was going to say is that there was a comment in public comment where somebody said that this was too much for too little. Uh, and I think highlighting what Council Member Fleming just said, uh, I hesitate to think where we would be if for decades people had been saying that little reforms were too little for us to actually do it. Um, there's always going to be a reason to say no, particularly when it comes to climate. There's always going to be some obstacle that's going to require an additional public policy option. We don't do things in a vacuum. And I'll point out that most of the homes that this will apply to are also going to have a solar requirement from the state. And so even something as simple as adding a battery backup to it makes that home more resilient and it actually makes it uh, more desirable, particularly for young home buyers. Let me tell you, I know that one. Uh, 
we saw a few months ago thousands of the next generation marching in the streets demanding that people who are in a position to do something about climate change actually get off their butts and do it. And they were asking us what temporary inconveniences we were living, willing to live with to make sure that they actually had a future. And what I've heard over and over again from the public is people like cooking on their gas stoves. I'll tell you, I can't cook on either, so I'm not a good judge. Um, but I, I would think that the students who are out there in the streets wouldn't find that as a sufficient reason to not begin addressing climate change in a meaningful way. Uh, this is a community that has felt the sting of climate change, and it's also a community that's not going to shrink away from its responsibility of doing our part to make sure other communities don't suffer the same fate. So I'm more than happy to cast my vote uh, today for this uh, and move this forward uh, in our community. So Madam City Clerk, if you wanna call the roll. Thank you. Vice Mayor Rogers. Aye. Council Member Combs. Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Olivares? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Tibbetts? Aye. So, Council Member Fleming, I believe you have a second motion. Indeed, thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa setting a time and place for a public hearing for the proposed adoption by reference of the 2019 California Energy Code, California Code of Regulations 24, Part 6, All Electric Low Rise Residential Reach Code, and wait for the reading of the text. Second. Sorry, I, I, can't, I can't read your fingers. 12-3. Okay, so we'll make that, that change that'll be on December 3rd. Can we clarify that it was originally posted for the 19th? We're about to get the attorneys involved, so this is about to get really complicated. <laughs> Go ahead, Sue. Um, uh, there, if, if the idea is that we wanna pair this up with the return of the building and fire codes. The date for the building and fire codes has not yet been determined. Um, there is not an issue. You could go ahead and set the public hearing for December 3rd. The effect will be that this would go into effect uh, if it's approved on the th on December 3rd. Just five minutes. Just we'll give the city manager a few minutes. I thought most codes came into effect on January 1st, so I'd like clarification. Um, um, I will, the, uh, the, the path I was gonna take us down uh, is not necessary. Um, I think staff is supportive of um, moving forward with the resolution for the public hearing to remain next week. Um, and uh, I, I would support that. Okay, so could you repeat your motion please? Absolutely. Um, so I move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa setting a time for next week, uh, 11 19, and place for a public hearing for the proposed adoption by reference of the 2019 California Energy Code, California Code of Regulations, Title 22, Part 6, All Electric Low Rise Residential Reach Code, and wait for the rating of the text. A second. Excellent. Madam Clerk. Vice Mayor Rogers. Aye. Council Member Combs. Aye. Council Member Fleming. Aye. Council Member Oliveras. Aye. Council Member Sawyer. Aye. Council Member Tibbetts. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that passes unanimously. Uh, we will uh, move on now. Item 14.4 has been uh, moved to next week. So we'll discuss it then. Uh, item 15.1, uh, there is a uh, letter in your packets. Do we have adi any additional cards for the second public comment section? 
Thank you. Is Max? Hi, Mayor. It's, yes. It's after midnight my time, and I'm going to hang up. Thank you very much for running the meeting so effectively. Absolutely. You have a good one. So I have Maggie O'Brien, who I believe has left. Brenda? Seeing nobody rise. Alex, go ahead. You'll have your three minutes. Is there a timer? It should pop up on the screen. I'll tell you what, I'll count okay. for you if you want while we... Okay, great, thanks. Okay, thank you for your time. I just want to bring to your attention, um, again, about the 5G, 4G infrastructure being placed. And I know we're having a study session on December 10th. I look forward to another one, our third one. But I just want to point out that since February 14th, 2017, when Eric McHenry, a city employee, came in here with a Verizon representative, Miss Canada, and had you guys change your council policy and allow them to install these things wherever they wanted, they haven't been really accurate with their information to you guys. And that continued into the study sessions. Let alone did they not tell you guys that over 60 of the 72 proposed were gonna be in residential zones or next to schools. Um, Montgomery High School, they had denied a cell phone tower a few years earlier and they would have gotten thousands of dollars for that cell phone tower. But Verizon came in a few years later and put one in front of their school and the city's getting $300 a year for that tower without any public notification. So as Mayor Corsi said last year, they, they came and they ran roughshod through neighborhoods because they could. And here's one of the things, we're putting 5G infrastructure, I, we don't have a projector here. I think that's kind of ironic. But um, I just wanna show you, this is something that Eric McHenry said last year that really uh, kind of rubbed me the wrong way and was not accurate. When trying to squash people's fears about having these put next to their house, he said, not apply to people underneath the pole and it's because of the way the antennas radiate um, the antennas generally radiate left and right horizontally and so ironically if you're under the pole you get less radiation than if you're a block away because it's right above your head so in no cases do they radiate low so the one over save your comments please here's reality about a block away from that same cell phone tower. And we are at levels still very high, but below 2,000 millivolts. Anyways, I could go on and on and the 20, over 20 that have been installed so far, but they're very powerful. They're very powerful right underneath the antenna. They're not 100 watts like he had told you several times. They're actually, those radios are each 100 watts, but there's four of them. By the time they're amplified, that antenna can put out 4,000 watts. You'd have to be crazy to want one of these things next to your house. Talk about energy efficiency too. You guys wanna be a green city. The carbon footprint of these things spraying that much electricity into the air so your mobile device can use a speck of it. Think about the carbon footprint of that. No one's asking that. So I hope the city attorney is privy to the recent uh, of appeals decisions, the Fourth Circuit and Ninth Circuit. They give cities uh, more. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And with that, we are adjourned.